Hello and welcome to James's interviews with the great and good of professional wrestling and one of the greatest and goodest of all time has got to be Don Morocco. Uh, formerly Marvelous, aka The Rock as well. Here he is, Don Morocco. How are you doing? Straight from Hawaii. Oh, good day, mates. How you doing? Tell you who. <laughs> my mentor, my mentors from uh, from England, Lord Lord James Blears, Jan Blears. He started me in professional wrestling. He's actually a honestly a lord. He, he was uh, knighted after uh, World War II. Really? He was. Uh, it's a great story. Uh, he was on a um, oh Sharon the dogs. He was on a uh, Dutch uh, merchant ship that got uh, sunk. They got blown up uh, by a tor torpedo by a Japanese submarine in, in World War II. And uh, the ship was sunk. So all his, uh, you know, shipmates and everything were, were overboard. And the, the Japanese took him on the deck of their submarine. And obviously there was no room to keep him in the sub. So they're going on the line. They're all the, tied together, handcuffed. And they're going on, on the line and uh, putting a bullet in the back of everybody's head. As they as they went along, so he uh, he was handcuffed to, to two or, two or three other other gentlemen, other other shipmates, and he said, "The hell with this! I'm going to die one way or another." And he was a swimmer, wrestler from from England, and athlete. He just jumped off the sub with the um, I forget. I think it was two guys. One guy was already dead, and, and another another gentleman. They're handcuffed together. They floated in the water. Um, shot at you know. Shot at him at the water, like like the movies. So, shot at him at the water and everything. And uh, but as it went away, the sub drifted away, and they drifted away, and survived for uh, about a day in the middle of the ocean. Uh, I believe it's the Atlantic, or more not probably Pacific, obviously because they're Japanese in the Pacific, in the middle of the ocean, with uh, with a dead. Uh, I think they got rid of the dead, the dead sailor oh. eventually, and then they were picked up by a. Uh, by a Danish uh, Danish vessel, passing. That's unbelievable. And uh, the fact that he'd saved everybody and everything, he was he was later knighted after the uh, after World War II, Lord Blairs. Wow. True story. It's 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 uh it's documented in uh, I, I suppose English and and professional wrestling history and stuff. It's a true story. Correct. Well, that's... And that's the man is that's the man who started me what? professional wrestling. Do you know what? I, I was actually going to ask you about Talio Blairs as well and. Crack! I had no idea. I mean, he's just a name to me because I, obviously, I wasn't around at the time. And even if I was, I would have never got Hawaiian Fifty State Wrestling or anything like that. But crikey! Yeah, I, I mean, well, what the whole family. But well, his, his, uh Jimmy Blairs, who passed several years ago, was, was my best. We like, went to school together, and he was uh, my best man at my wedding, at uh, my second wedding. <laughs> but uh, you know, we're, we're good save. We, good we, save. We, we surfed together. <laughs> he was uh, nineteen seventy two. World uh, world champion surfer, and um, you know we surfed together. They lived out of Macaw, and I was real close with the family. It's strange. And so I I got with Billy Robinson after that, and there's several other uh, English performers. You know that's uh, my time. Uh, one's so actually Lord gonna, is the one that started me. One's actually going to come up a bit later, and I will uh, I will sort of uh, try and surprise you with a bit of an odd one. He grew up in Droylston, like ten miles up from me. But the very first question I wanted to ask you because obviously you know you. Oh, it's still of the territories. You've been in so many different territories from the 70s and 80s. And my first question is, have you ever wrestled a bear? No, no. I used to play with the bear. I was a main eventer. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. I was in angles and championship, man. I didn't... Uh, the bear was usually re reserved for a semi or preliminary guy. But I used to go and play with it in the back. Uh, they'd keep him in the shower and they'd pace back and forth uh, endlessly and they're, they're so cool they're so much stronger and they're so uh it, uh, it, was, it was a victor uh, oh i think it was, that was tuffy truesdale it's the other george allen's bear and i i would go uh i oh yeah if, if the poor bear wanted to wrestle you yeah, there, there wouldn't be a there would no contest so uh I suppose you wouldn't have wrestled any animals then, because I know there was like at some points orangutans and crocodiles and alligators and all that kind of thing. I suppose that was a bit maybe it wasn't in the past from when you started, but you were just never involved in that. The bear, the bear, the bear traveled. The the bear, the midgets, and the lady wrestlers at the time when I first started, they were they had a circuit. All they would come into your your territory that you happened to be in at the time, and they'd work two or three weeks. 
or, you know, make the loop or whatever, and then they'd be gone. So they were there on a, they were on, they were on a pretty tight schedule. <laughs> I love how the bear was really in demand, like Andre yeah. the Giant. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so actually, the first thing that I was really going to ask you, because I just thought it was a bit of a silly question to open up with, but it's sort of not a silly question with the bear thing. But um, I know that you, uh, so actually, the first question is how you got started, because you just said before, uh, Lord Tallyho Blizz. Um, was he the person who brought you into the business or was he the person who inspired you to become a professional wrestler? Both. Both. I was, I was, I was with the family. I, you know, I, well, I, I, sur- I, was, uh, I surfed quite a bit when I was, when I was younger. You know, even in my, when I, I, I got, I grew up and, and then even came back from uh, after my WWF days, I, I continued to surf. So for about the last 10 years, I, I haven't been able to. And so just physically, you know, uh, mm. not because I lack of wanting to, but um, yeah, no, I'm with the family, uh, Jimmy, Laura, Carol, and Clinton, and then Lee Blears was uh, was Mrs. Blears. She used to she used to have her, her famous spaghetti and or a soya chicken dinners up at the they had a they had a house in Waikiki, where all there was like a surf surf house. They're a cool family. Yeah. Do you remember the first time you were, because obviously if you were going to be surfing from a young age, you know, you were built out up some decent muscle. But do you remember the first time you looked at yourself in the mirror and thought, you know, I could really, I could get in the ring and, you know, be a part of this? Um, I wrestled amateur in, in high school and stuff. So I state title and I was a football player. And then uh, it was just my lack of uh, spectacularness in school that, that brought me back to Hawaii. For a while, I was supposed to go back to, I was supposed to go to the University of Hawaii, and then they wanted to send me to um, uh, an, uh, a local college for a semester and bring up my grades. And I just, you know, I, I wasn't going for it. So Talio and uh, Sandra Kovacs from Vancouver. So I was one of those nights over at uh, 425 Neo where the Blues just had, had a home in Waikiki was a spaghetti night, and the Sandra Kovacs, a promoter from uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, in Canada, was in, because he was uh, an old uh, old friend. And said, "Well, you want to, what do you want to do? You want to go?" So a couple weeks later, I was on a plane uh, on the way to uh, Vancouver, British Columbia. Didn't have a clue. Not like today when they have wrestling schools and stuff. You know, I just uh, I'd wrestled, you know, but I had no idea, no, no. Well, you know, I was a wrestling fan, and you know, it was half of the go half smart. But I had no idea what the professional wrestling was about at all. Uh, when did you find out uh, in the absolute oh, years, affirmative? You know, ca- cauliflower ear, alley, and a cauliflower ear, and a sore back. You know, just the years on the road, and experience, you know, learning. And well, my, my first match was, you know, as that, my first uh, first year or so was, you know, all, everything was a revelation. <laughs> but, um, you know, it was it's just a... Uh, you know, you live and learn, but as that uh, transition from out of the ring to in, in the ring, the, the, and knowing, you know, uh, the difference, you know, it, it was, uh, yeah, it's always enlightening. I guess. <laughs> so how come you, in, were you on the mainland when you were sort of recruited or were you in Hawaii and how come you didn't start your Hawaii. career? How come you didn't start your career in Hawaii? I mean, I've actually got it here that it's Portland. I might be wrong there. No, that's right. I was actually with Vancouver. But uh, Don Owens, a promoter in Portland, would uh, bring two guys down to um, to work on the TV, or a couple guys, you know, several guys down to work on the. They had a Saturday at an arena that they converted from a bowling alley to a wrestling arena. So Tuesdays were their uh, house shows, as it were, and Saturday they shot the TV. Uh, they shot the TV from that that converted bowling alley. So they'd bring two guys down from Vancouver to. Um, to, to put up, put over the, um, you know, the, the Portland talent. And um, I was the first one, you know, it was, I think it was, uh, you got $75, 75 US to go down and $25 for transportation. So you made a hundred bucks the first night. I thought that was, uh, I thought that was pretty exciting. That's not and bad money, especially for 1970. Yeah, yeah. Uh, why? Uh, that's, that's, uh, I was, that's how I ended up uh, starting <laughs> in Portland. My first match, as opposed to Vancouver. Vancouver was actually the first territory, British Columbia. I've got you. Um, why, why Don Morrow? Uh, p- p- promoter, 
thought he had a, I had an, uh, had an idea. So I was Don Morrow for a couple of five or six months. I, I don't know why he wanted to change it. I was comfortable with Morocco, but uh, as soon as I, as soon as I got out of there and spent a couple a uh, month or two in LA, I, I went back to actually I ended up coming back to Hawaii after about six, seven months. I started on the road for Christmas and uh, you know, I, I'd been here as a, a football player in, in high school and a high school wrestler and, you know, uh, surfer around, you know, surf contests and stuff around the island. So, um, you know, they, they, I was known in Morocco. I, I'd grown up there at here as Morocco. So it was an obvious transition back to down Morocco. So uh, obviously I wasn't really around at all. I wasn't even a glint in the milkman's eye, as you call yeah. it. Uh, you know, the time when Hawaii was like uh, sort of rocking and rolling a bit more. So uh, would you take me back uh, So uh, to the Hawaii Territory? And what was the Hawaii Territory? What was like a typical loop? How many days did you work? What were the payoffs like? Uh, who were the regular stars? Who were the stars you might get from uh, overseas to uh, bump up the house? Uh, Hawaii was a great. Hawaii was the greatest territory in the world at the time. I think you'd work maybe two or three days a week. You have a, you have a Wednesday show at uh, at whatever the big big uh, venue, either the Blaisdell or later Block Arena, and then once a month or six weeks, you go to the Blaisdell Center for the big blow off show. And then uh, you'd have a military base, either one of the military bases on the weekend or Alder Island, uh, to Ma uh, Kauai or Maui or, or the Big Island of Hawaii. So that's, you know, that was a, like a weekly, weekly, so you did three days, you know, and then, it, it, well, the other guys are more established. They, they picked up, uh, they would pick up shots in San Francisco or LA across, but I, you know, I was, I was nobody, so. You know, but, but you know, it was just fine for me. I was making, I was making, oh, about 250, 300 dollars would have been a good week. But uh, we had a deal at a place, the uh, Waikiki Ambassador Hotel. It was 150, 758 dollars a month, right on Waikiki Beach. And uh, I, I was, I had a little van that I'd had before I got into wrestling. And I, um, I, but I got everywhere my bicycle basically. So it was, you know, it was, you know, it was just, I, I guess before Beach Bum was established, I, I well, that's what I was as Beach Bum. But they had uh, some of the greatest talent in the world. There was uh, King Courtesy Alkea, I, I think, who wrestled extensively in Europe. And, uh, and then I think he, he toured with uh, who, Ricky Starr, I believe, is the, the ballerina, the guy that had the bell. Uh, he was, Curtis is about 350, 380, and Ricky Starr was like 200 pound. Uh, like, you know, Curtis knew how to do business. And then there was Johnny Baran, who was like the uh, one of the all time favorites here. Ripper Collins, um, guys you'd probably, uh, Jim Haiti, Nick Bockwinkle. Uh, what they had here in Hawaii is uh, they would run back in those days, the travel wasn't as. as, as as extensive. So Japan and Australia were running, would run not simultaneously, but have run their, their six weeks week tours. So when the guys were coming back from Japan and they paid cash out there and have a bunch of money, they stop here in Hawaii, or coming back from Australia, stop here in Hawaii, get booked, write it off as a business trip, uh, you know, wrestle. So all the, all the greatest talent in the world was coming through, you know, San Martino and Carpentier and Rocca, Blasi, everybody was coming. Well, Blasi was in California, but all the greatest talent was uh, was coming through East Coast, uh, Middle America, European. European. Uh, everybody's coming through here for a stop, coming back from either Japan or Australia. So you had a big selection of great international stars to work with your local guys here. So it's a, uh, it was just a like a melting pot as as, as well as, uh, as as far as nationalities as well, as far as wrestlers as well. Do you remember the uh, first, like, real legend, real big name that you got in the ring with in Hawaii? Oh, Mad Dog Vashon. Maurice Vashon, he was a, he was a character. But I, just, I was uh, in Vancouver, I wrestled uh, Kaniski on TV. He just, he just murdered me on TV. And Bob Brown, a couple other guys, you know. I was uh, around with Mark Lewin, Mark Lewin and King Curtis. In fact, in Hawaii, my first uh, 
my first match was with any and he, we went to school same schools different times but we went to school together and he was uh was an established uh had been an established heel for a long time and there's a battle royal but you know how they throw matches on before the battle royal so they booked me with curtis before and i was green as green as the grass you know i was just you know i was just green and, and uh Went out there. He made me look like a million dollars. I, I got uh, managed to get my hand raised. And Francis and Cal Hill came to me and said, you, "What are you doing back in California?" I said, "Nothing. You, you want to stay here for a while?" And then I, you know, I said, "Yeah, sure, of course." <laughs> Staying home in Hawaii, and then I stayed here. Surf, surf, wrestle. I, you know, it was paradise. <laughs> who was um was the Hawaii Territory affiliated with anyone else who would send <laughs> um stars over? Not just people who were going to or from Japan. Originally Portland. Originally, he uh, Ed Francis borrowed the money to buy the territory from Al Karasik, an old uh, old time an old time wrestler who started started the wrestling off here in uh, maybe even pre fifties. But I, I know that he had through the nineteen fifties. So Al uh, Ed bought borrowed the money from uh, Don Owens. So Don Owens was a was a partner here in Hawaii for a long time, and uh, Don Owens, and then. Uh, Roy Shires in the north, the Northern California territory. They went to war here. They started to run, wanted to run their cards, but found out, you know, just too expensive to fly hmm. so many people over and to, you know, the building and all the, the bite, the bite the building took and all the, you know, expenses that they had to kind of come together with the Hawaii promotion eventually. How was uh, Ed Francis? Sorry, go ahead. ahead. That's all right. Oh, I was just going to ask how Ed Francis, was, uh, Ed, uh, Ed Francis was as a boss. Yeah. Oh, he was great. Uh, they had great ideas. It, it was, uh, it's like, um, well, actually more, more complete than the WWE's right, right now. They, Johnny Baran was coming out of caskets and I mean, they had all kinds of, uh, you know, it, and you're talking, you know, you're talking the, the seventies, you know, the late sixties into the seventies out skits and, you know, off color personalities and, and, uh, you know, off all kinds of, you know, stuff going on that, uh, that the rest, regular wrestling world did. I'd say Ed Francis, Dory Funk uh, Sr. from Amarillo, the, the Funk brothers, and, and Eddie Graham out of Florida. And, and they were the most innovative, I think, of all the promoters, basically because they had small territories and they had, had good crews. And then the, as everybody kind of, Ed, Ed's forte was the TVs and the strength where, where Eddie and, and, uh, and, and Dory Sr. Uh, created the, uh, fantastic wrestlers workers in the ring and on the mic as well was it like um you know like the memphis territory it was like in that small area it was like the most watched television show by far sure sure they had a they had friday friday evenings i think after after the news after the evening late night news i think from hour hour and an hour and a half maybe two hours from like 10 30 to 12 or so and that was a popular and then they came back on Saturday uh, afternoon at a studio show, which was an hour and a half and was had basically about 15 to 20 minutes wrestling and uh, about 50 minutes, just, just promos. Because they had the greatest, uh, they had the greatest talkers here that, that uh, with Colin Reaper Collins and Johnny Baran and, and Curtis, they had the, the greatest promo guys in the business at, at one time in a collection at one time, you know before the Pipers and the Macho Mans and those kind of guys they had. It was just, uh, in fact, uh, Lanny Poffo came on the the uh, podcast that I do, Making Waves, on Thursdays at 11 p.m. Hawaii time, 5, 5 p.m. Uh, Eastern. But uh, Lanny came on, and uh, his him, when he was over here with his brother, Macho Man, and uh, and uh, Angelo is their dad, and when, when Macho Man and Randy was... Uh, Developing a persona, a missing link, Pompero Furpo, of course, the in the voice in the, the the voice in there, and and Curtis with the uh, continuity and the uh, you know the, the brilliance, of, you know the semblance of words and phrases, you know the the attractiveness of, of putting a story together. So that's where he took his too. That's what Lanny told me that uh, Randy had done his studying and patterned his interviews off of off of those two guys, which I'm sure you know a lot of. A lot of us living here, I did. I'm sure I'm. I'm sure I did, whether consciously or subconsciously, or, or not. You know that they they're all that good. 
with uh, Ken Curtis. So I only really know him from WCW briefly, and I'll, I'll step away from the mic. He goes, Sullivan, my son. And, uh, you know, with the Taskmaster and everything, and maybe a little bit with um, the... Um, he was the wizard in the WWF, wasn't he, when you were there, yeah. in fact? Uh, what was yeah. he? What was his uh, whole presentation in the sixties and seventies when he was active in the ring? Oh, he was uh, pre Bruiser. He was he was Bruiser Brody or Abdullah. He set the standards in Japan. He um, back to Lord Blair's again. As much as much as he hated the Japanese for being torpedoed and his people being bombed and stuff, he after Fred Blassie. He became the uh, the the president of the Japanese uh, uh, New Japan uh, uh, All Japan excuse me All Japan Pro Wrestling, and um, he was the one that had brought Curtis and Mark Lewin and, and those. So Curtis was the one that, that established that out of the ring stacking chairs, you know, fighting all over the building and everything else. So as he sort of passed it down to Abdullah and Bruiser Brody and everything, I think Brody even one time when he was alive, rest his soul. Even even mentioned, you know, that Curtis is the one that took him around when he, when he first came. To, well, they took him to Australia, Frank Goodish to Australia, and they and for there he became with uh, Lewin and Curtis. He became Bruiser Brody, and um, from Australia, you know, they got booked because uh, the Curtis had ties to Japan, so they took him. He, he went to Japan with him on the and and uh, did that, uh, you know, that wild, uh, aggressive, crazy style, you know. All over the all over the region that the Japanese people love. I will have to ask you this because it just kept pots in my in my mind. Did you ever see Ricky Dozan on television? Uh, when I was when I was young, yeah, and I've seen I've seen clips lately of him. But uh, they had uh, they had, Hawaii had had sumo wrestlers coming through here as well. Guys that would uh, once they they got out of the sumo, Ricky Dozan. I remember Toyona Bori and a couple other guys. I don't remember the names now, but I remember. Toyona board because they had a massive 50 something inch chest, you know, and he was a retired sumo. So we had retired sumos as well coming to wrestle, you know, and the, the guys were, were saltier back then, too, <laughs> you know, they weren't, they were doing a, they weren't as trick oriented. They were, they were a lot of, you know, less, I'm, less solid. I'm, I miss those days, definitely. Uh, I'll, I'll ask you one more question with Hawaii because, I mean, I I tell you, the, I had to stop myself writing questions for you because it was like almost like my eyes were falling out. My head was just, I've got to ask him this, I've got to ask him this, got to understand. Uh, but the one thing I will ask you. Do you remember um, PPW, uh, Leah Maivia, when she took over from Peter? Uh, I believe you wrestled for her. Sure, yeah. I would come back, I would try to sneak into town when Peter and Leah had the, my had the promotion. I'd been working, you know, in the mainland US and, and you know, working every night and just uh, just trying to get away from the business for a while. And then my phone would ring 12, one o'clock in the morning. It'd be Peter calling from some bar there, but uh, I need to, I need some help coming down. So yeah, I was, I was their heel. I, you know, they had the Polynesian, they had this little Polynesian stable of, uh, of, uh, of wrestlers. And I, uh, I assumed the heel role. In fact, this we wrestled the, uh, that man mountain, uh, David or Goliath, David, giant, giant David, the giant, the English fella, the giant. He's like he was a huge guy. It wasn't giant haystacks, was it? Uh, could be. He wrestled in Calgary a bit, quite a bit. Uh, he had a great big beard, about six eight, like blue overalls, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the guy. He came and I was. I think they had let me locked in the, in the cage or something. I, he was evidently, you know, supposedly the guy I'd brought in to uh, get rid of Peter. And, um, you know, hulking guy. So something happened. Come, somebody came out, let me out of the cage. And the three of us are in the ring and trying to, you know, taking over on Peter. And Peter and I broke off and we're fighting and we're watching that giant. He's, he's slowly getting smaller and smaller. And two huge, two huge Polynesian guys and had him by the legs and pulled him out of the ring. <laughs> So, so Peter and I immediately stopped fighting one another and jumped out of the ring to, to, to you know, pull the guys off the giant. And, and uh, he, he came back, grabbed his bag, went back to the airport, never stopped. I don't think he stopped to get paid off or anything. He, he'd flown all the way, driven from Saskatoon back to Calgary, flown from Calgary overnight, went straight to the locker room. You know, he just had a miserable day. 
and just went back and just went went back to the airport and said the hell with this. I'm going back to Calgary. Was uh was Pete Maivier like the man? Like, because you must have heard like the stories. Maybe a fight in Japan or two happened. Uh, like, what was his reputation in the back? And did you ever see him in action? Unless it was with his wife arguing, obviously. His wife was a tough, tough son of a gun. She they used to stand toe to toe. He was the man. He was he, you know he was a chief. He was. Uh, I, I I've heard his reputation in England and and you know and the the. the, the the run-ins he had with Billy and, and some other stuff, you know, but he was uh, always a consummate pro, you know, around, uh, around the boy. He, 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 he remarked about that several times. It's why I, I went the first time he went to England, he was about two, five, two ten, And they, they just beat the snot out of him. And then he came back about two eighty, And then he was, uh, he made, you know, it's the same thing they did with Hulk. You know, they, they got him down and they got him in the gym and they taught him, they beat him every day and they beat him and they beat him. And, you know, eventually, unless you're completely lost, you, 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 you learn how to take care of yourself. Well, that's, you know, that's what Peter did, you know, and he was a rugged guy to begin with, you know, so he didn't, he didn't need a lot, a lot of teaching, you know, to <laughs> develop into, you know, an animal. The territory was really, you know, doing well at that time. Why did it sort of fall apart so quickly? I know you weren't there at the time, but I mean, what did you understand to be? I think... Lost their, lost, lost the main building. Lost uh, uh, everything. It was old, cigar stained, smoky uh, wrestling. They call it Civic Auditorium. It was right in downtown Honolulu. Uh, they'd have roller derby there in the, in the, uh, the summers, but year long, every Wednesday without a fail. 8 p.m. they have uh, professional wrestling and, uh, you know, the, all the great stars from all over the world. So that, that they had that. Uh, and then they, they sold that as progress came along, buildings started moving in and parking and everything else became less and less. And they finally tore, tore the building down, put a bunch of banks and business buildings there. So they lost, they lost that building, which was really the, the, the heart of uh, 50 estate wrestling at the time. They went to the they went to Block Arena, uh, with the military base. But that's always a house. It, actually, as as distance wise, aesthetically, it was you know actually actually nicer place. But people have, would have to get on go on a military base, and uh, you know it's just kind of a hassle that, that uh, people weren't used to. The, the TV, the TV lost. You know, man, I probably the, the talent the ta- talent level went down as well. You know, but the, the TV. Uh, TV lost its zing, you know, without, without Ed, Ed, Ed was a, you know, Ed was a tremendous prom- promoter, good mind, good organizer. He, uh, one night he couldn't give himself a black eye, or, so not, he, Ripper Collins couldn't give him a black eye, hit him and hit him and hit him. So Ed, Ed had to crawl under the ring and give himself, he was, it was his town. He was the promoter. So he had to give himself his own black eye. <laughs> That's, uh, he and, uh, he and Ripper had a had a, a running feud for several years, going on back and forth, back and forth. Where they, you know, if business got slow or something happened, you know, and he and Ripper they'd break out the old uh, Ripper Ed Francis uh, feud again. You know, that would go. So, yeah, he told the story. He had to go, and he's and he's uh, trying, he's trying to black, black in his own eyes, so because Ripper couldn't get it done. <laughs> that is dedication. That just doesn't exist anymore, is it? That's your territory. <laughs> <laughs> well that was my first question was about the hawaii territory i've got four more pages of it but i'm gonna actually um skip across a little bit here and there and do you know i really want to know a bit more about nwa hollywood i know you didn't have the longest time there but it's one of the territories that seems to get the least amount of press and the first question is did you ever roll with judo gene labelle well no i he was He's several years older than I am. I, he was, you know, spoke with him, you know, and I always conversed with him. And he was, you know, he's, he's a great guy. But uh, and he spent a lot of time in Hawaii. I met him first in Hawaii, coming here when that 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 back in the uh, early '70s when he'd come through and he was wrestling here. And he'd uh, and he'd take us down. We'd go down with uh, Billy and him down to the old Civic Auditorium that they had the ring up there, pretty much all week long, unless they had roller derby or or a rock concert or something in for the week. But they'd leave the ring. And leave the ring in. So we'd, we'd go and we get we'd work out there, and I mean of course he was uh, 
1960 gold, gold medal uh, um, judo champion from the Olympics. And he won it in Tokyo, which was uh, even more astounding for an American to win, you know, gold medal in Tokyo. So he was, but he was, you know, he was, he was, a, he was a nice guy. He seemed like a real, real fool doing interviews and stuff, but he would, you know, he was just putting the wrestlers over. <laughs> He was intelligent. He was an intelligent man. How was uh, Mike LaBelle? Was he completely different to Gene? I, I, I don't know his background, but I know his name is sort of, uh, you know, on the uh, above the pub. He was a promoter. I, I I never really had much, uh, much, much contact with, you know, hello, how are you? Hmm. You know, goodbye. I wasn't, it wasn't, uh, not as much a relationship as people did with Gene. Yeah. Gene was more outgoing, one of the boys. He took over that, um, that stuntman, the stuntman uh, union, stuntman organization in Hollywood, he um, through his mother Eileen Eaton and the Olympic Auditorium and stuff. He would he'd be, been if you look on all the old a lot of the old Disney films, and a lot of the you know a lot of the old uh, kind of comic uh, action comedy movies. That he was uh, he was a bad guy. A lot of the things you know getting getting beat up by you know somebody or something like that. So he he'd. Uh, He'd taken over the stunt, and that came from Vic Christie, Lord Blair's best friend, who had uh, his, him and his, uh, he and his brother Ted had uh, at first gone into stunt, uh, the stunt business in Hollywood. And I uh, get, you know, they were, they were, they were rivers and jokers and always telling stories and personal. So the, you know, the movie stars loved them <laughs> to have around. And they had a good time with the movie stars too. <laughs> I guess they played ribs on everybody. And, you know, Ted Christie was a, famous uh one of the famous original rivers in in the business that, that a lot of guys don't know but the, uh, i guess you know all the directors and actors and stuff took a liking for them and it went from the past from gene uh passed from them to gene and he uh he led this the stunt uh union organization but he was a good guy he is a good guy pretty old now but... yeah he's like 90 he's almost 90 and the story that still yeah. pervades is that he uh choked out Steven Seagal and made him shit his pants. Yeah, yeah. I heard that too. I was doing a TV spot too and the actors were, the actors were, you know, you go, he's the wrestler and it's, oh yeah, Seagal. And <laughs> Bill Bell. And that, that story was kind of going around under, undercover there. Uh, someone who, uh, someone else who just doesn't seem to get any kind of publicity really, even though he was a main event, it was John Tolos. Do you remember him? Oh yeah, what a great guy. And he was, I didn't know until, uh, you know, I dived, dove into Facebook and stuff the last year or two that uh, he was such a big card in Los Angeles. Where he was, uh, he was Los Angeles. It was for him and Freddie Blassie and, and uh, a couple of Mexican stars like Neil Moskowitz and, and a couple other guys. He was Los Angeles. But he was, a, he was just a easygoing guy, you know, just funny, you know, hello, my dear. He had that deep bellowing voice and, all the girl, he was, the ladies said, "Hello, my dear. What? Well, that's a beautiful dress. Did you make that yourself?" You know, everything like that. He'd have a same line that he that he would, that he would, it would go. But it was, you know, it meant it fun and and uh, you know, easy going. He, he was a he was a good guy. So, how was the territory? Because I'm thinking, when were you there? Around seventy one, seventy two, sort of that era. Uh, young yeah. in your career, like who were the big stars at the time? Because I've got a few. Oh, you mentioned Freddie Blassie. Uh, Gory Guerrero. I don't know if he was there at the same time as you were. I believe he might well have been. Well, he was a no. He was he was a father of the girl, girl family. Was he? So was he, he was he uh, not wrestled uh, in Hollywood then. No, not in not in Hawaii. He was uh, Chavo Guerrero. Was out of L.A. He and uh, Roddy Piper did a lot of did a lot of business in Los Angeles. So it's Chavo. I'm, I I know I know I know Chavo. I was closer friends with uh, younger brother Mondo. He comes before the Eddie, the one that passed, and Hector. He was a, I think he's right under Shavel, as far as so I worked with Shavel quite a bit, San Francisco, and uh, and he was over in Hawaii here for a while at the uh, at the hotels and stuff. So yeah, he was, you know, they were cool guys. Shavel was pretty much an innovator as well, because it wasn't he the first person to to do the moon salt, so they say. Shavel. So they say, yeah. Um, could be. I, I'm not sure. Well, well, Carpentier was doing it. Uh, he did that backflip off the top rope. Hmm. Uh, he didn't uh, didn't splash anybody, but I remember there, there were a couple of guys back then that were doing that uh, 
back in Carp's day, he he would do the that backflip off the top. So I I'm not sure, you know. Uh, I don't think anybody else used it as a finish until uh, probably shovel. I, you know, I don't know. Uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. So who are some of the other big stars that maybe don't get as much uh, publicity or, or people who are just sort of stalwarts at the territory who may not be remembered now? Well, Moondog Maine was here at the time, Lonnie Maine. And he was, uh, he was like, uh, man, uh, Mickey McFoley before Mick Foley was, was, uh, he used to take uh, insane bumps. Just, uh, just, uh, just a great bump guy. Stood on the top rope of, uh, the top, you know, second and third rope in the, that Portland arena and have somebody drop up, drop kick them and go over the top turnbuckle right out to the floor and land on the floor, things like that. You know, just, uh, things now that, that are commonplace, but back in those days, it was pretty extraordinary. Uh, I'm going to go sort of off piece slightly, and I've got to ask you this: the first Whatever. time you, the first time you met Andre the Giant, I was young. I was really young. I was just I was in the, I was in Vancouver, and he was he came he was he he just come to North America, and he, and Don uh, Leo Jonathan's home was Vancouver, uh, British Columbia, Vancouver. And um, he'd come to, you know, to have meetings with uh, Leo. And, um, uh, you know, he was around the uh, the Vancouver wrestling. So um, he was green, I was green, you know, and, uh, you know, both like, you know, two ships in the night, <laughs> you know, sailing nowhere, nowhere to go. So I, you know, I became friends with him then earlier, real early in my first, and then as time went by, we, we would pass and then, uh, Finally, in New York, he, he became a, a fixture out of a WWE, WWF back in those days. He started, stopped, uh, did, didn't couldn't travel anymore. It was just too much. Well, that, you know, then WWE traffic, traveling is insane. But he, he would just stay out of one territory because WWE was turn, basically turning it to one territory, the whole, you know, North America. So it wasn't uh, that much of a reach for him going to, and he was the Vince Senior was booking him, so him going to Florida, or Georgia, or Carolina, or something was you know out of the realm because he was now working for the WWF. Hmm. Uh, you must uh, you must remember the first time you saw him drinking more than maybe an entire football team could probably drink. Uh, what's yeah. the most you ever saw him do in one sitting? Um, I don't know, but so we came back. Um, we're in a plane coming back from. Uh, Miami one night with a, a Lone Star. It's kind of his hour, little hour plus flight. I remember he bought uh, like two or three six packs of uh, those the half court beers, the, the eight the sixteen ounces. And before we landed, he finished that. And I, I, you know, about like the two twelve packs. I, I, I gave him another six pack that I'd had with me, and he killed that. Then we, we got in the car and went to. Uh, the, the Imperial Room, or wherever it was, a place at that time that, that you got back from after the wrestling matches. But I, I wasn't in on any of those 120 bottle beer nights or anything like that. But I was with him. I was in the back of the bus with him in Japan, and you know, had a lot, a lot of fun with him. Oh goodness, did you ever actually travel on a plane with Andre in, uh, to Japan? Oh, many times. Yeah, he was on the. He, he traveled. He traveled the circuit with us in the WWF towards the end there when he. When he, uh, you know, and, and we were in Europe together. He was on the on the European tour, and and uh, yeah, we were together quite a bit. You know, it was uh, as he got older. He was, you know, he was he was a good group, but as he got older, the back and the pain and everything started to wear on him. You know, and the, the travel and you know it's hard. And, you know, no, no, can't find you know a bed that's not comfortable, or you know, and, and his back was causing him. You know, he was sore from the growth and his back had hurt him. Yeah. Was he a bit of a closet, like, ladies' man on the road? Because you wouldn't think it to look at him. There's no closet about it, brother. He was he was out there. He yeah. had uh, he had ladies all over the all over the place. He had the uh, first he had in Hawaii here, he had a uh, I remember Curtis, oh you see he had a big Tongan girlfriend that ate hair. That's when he had the air afro and, and you know Curtis would he would blow up the story that She's about six five, and they got the hair. They both hair got their hair sticking out the hair. 
It looked like two trees walking down the street. <laughs> but yeah, he had a, he had there. Then he had the, later on, he had, had another girlfriend from San Francisco. And we were out and with John, John told us, and the giant and the girl a place this mixed fish market, which is quite a classy place back a long time ago. And uh, he and the girlfriend, so we're on the plane the next day, and Tolos is always cracking up. Oh, no, Giant's girlfriend gave gave birth to a nine pound tongue. <laughs> <laughs> and Andre would laugh and everything else. Then the next trip, she brought her family over. And that was it to meet Andre, and that was that was the end of their dating scene. <laughs> I also realized that I shouldn't have used the word closet with ladies, man. It just doesn't seem to have a go together, those two, oh, <laughs> those yeah, two yeah. terms. Uh, I don't suppose you ever saw Andre uh, kick some serious ass at any point when he was tested in the bar or something. One, one time in, uh, well, I was you know, in the rings a bunch of times, but uh, of course we weren't sitting with him. He was sitting, you know, we were, I was a heel and he, you know, he was with, with uh, Skolin and, and that crew, baby faces, but um, I think it was Bradford Hotel in Boston where we used to stay for the matches. And we usually go up there on a loop, you know, Bradford up in Portland, Maine, or you know, two or three towns up in the up, way up in the northeast uh, corridor of the U.S. So they were sitting there. It was an afternoon, and um, it was kind of it was real close to the rugged part of town. So a big Indian, uh, not, uh, Native American guy, big Indian guy, comes out and he. I want you. Yeah, man. You know, go away. You know, just leave. You know, no, come on, come on. So eventually, Andre started, stood up, and one of the guys just, you know, he's, and he he's, and he slapped the guy. And the guy kept, you know, the guy was just obnoxious, just going out. You know, it was over the top. But he slapped the guy. And the guy flew in the air about five feet, and before he even hit the ground, his legs started running. He started running to get out of there. But that's you know, aside from. Aside from there, there are a few guys that he, he just mauled in the ring playfully, you know, like the Iron Sheik or Bam Bam. I know I never saw him lose his, you know, he didn't lose his temper there. He just, you know, gently pawed a guy like a bear <laughs> and, he, and he flew in there. But I'm sure, you know, he could have done a lot of damage. Yeah, I've yeah. heard, um, God, I can't remember who was the recipient of it, but he used to do a thing where he used to sit down on someone and on one person he just went, <laughs> And just cut like the biggest yeah. fart possible on them. Yeah, I, I read that. So chic, I think. Error. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll tell you what, you know, um, because I'm going to skip the entire AWA section. I'm going to skip all of San Francisco. Uh, but I will have to ask one thing since we're sort of on like, uh, you know, maybe bar, bar fights and everything. Who would uh, win or who would be the toughest or scariest with these AWA sort of uh, stalwarts? As maybe Mad Dog for Sean, Larry Hennig. Blackjack Mulligan or Billy Robinson? Who would you fancy to be uh, come out on top in that battle? Well, Billy's got the reputation, man. There's a funny story about that. They were in all Winnipeg. Larry Henning, Bill Watts, Harley Race, a bunch of guys, you know, anybody in their right mind would never, you know, and then, then there's a little mad dog over in the corner. He's probably the worst one of all of them. And some... Some, you know, one of the tough guys from Winnipeg came or man, when it came up and decided, you know, Larry Henning and Watts and those guys were, they were pretty formidable, you know. So he, he decided to pick on the dog, which was the, probably the biggest mistake he'd made. The other, the other guys would probably just knock him out. The last thing, and these are just stories I've heard. The last thing they're pulling the dog out, he's got forks and everything. He's probably stabbing the guy with forks and biting him in the ears and, you know. He was he was a mad dog, you know. And scientifically, Billy, but it, you know, it's it's the wrestling world's funny. It, tough guys, you know. It, it's not the MMA or something, but everybody's got their day. Every, everybody's got their time, you know. Somebody uh, somebody can be the toughest, but you know, and uh, they, they can just catch you, you know. Robinson was Robinson was famed for uh, you know his his wrestling skills and his uh, his shooting uh, shooting abilities. Uh, Larry Henning was a, was a big man, big, powerful man, you know, so. Yeah, who else did you mention? Oh, uh, Black Chap Mulligan. Oh, there's another guy. <laughs> I remember Curtis, he said, who's the guy that used to hold him by the ankles and stomp their head in? And then, oh, Black Jack. yeah, that's it. So, you know, none of them were, none of them were, you know, flower dancers or anything. They were all... <laughs> 
So sticking with Mad Dog then, uh, was he just... Because I, I've heard the story where Mad Dog sort of loses his mind on an airplane and tries to rip the airplane door off uh, mid-flight. Oh, they were drinking. He, he, he'd always bust Adonis and... Uh, uh, Vern, would, Vern would get him, you know, uh, Vern, Adrian, he get me all fucked up. I cannot help, you know. I, and, you know, he'd be, you know, he'd be the puppy dog. They, you know, and he'd, <laughs> the heat would always go on Adrian. He didn't always catch all the heat for that. So, yeah. But he was, the, the dog was, you know, after he retired, he lost his leg. Uh, he lost a leg running. Uh, he moved to Lincoln or Omaha, Nebraska, somewhere in Nebraska. And I, he would go out and run. You know, definitely, well, you're familiar. You're definitely cold there. So one day a, a car skidded on the ice. He lost his, so after he, he would come to Hawaii every winter with his wife. He'd stay at the circle and he'd go down with the, uh, King Curtis had a beach stand, and it's on the wall at, at Waikiki. King Curtis used to call it the Wailing Wall, and the, the dog had a the dog had a, a cooking show in Montreal that went nationwide in Canada. Ah, the dog you make this, and then that you make that, but one does my they did. So uh, people, Canadians, during that time of year, all the you know multitude of Canadians visit, visiting Hawaii. So the, the the wall is right by the zoo and. On your on on the way up to Diamond Head and other seeing uh, tourist spots, so they'd pass by and they'd see uh, Maurice. I was ah Maurice, but John, how you mad dog? And the Canadians ah bonjour mon ami. You know, they just make the make the baby sitting there with one leg on the wall and getting tan. <laughs> and you know, the dog was a cool dude. He was he was a cool cat, man. Uh, I, this is actually sort of following on on this. Actually, the, <laughs> the next thing I've said, the craziest bar fight or fight you ever were involved in or just saw. Um, New Zealand one time, me and Lewin got attacked by a bunch of guys down in one of those pubs there. Was, we used to stay in the... One night, I was, one night I'd be in the Intercontinental Hotel in Melbourne, five-star hotel. The next night I'd be in the embassy in Christchurch, New Zealand. And that that was like, a, that would take me the old uh, cowboy westerns with the doors and the dogs. That place was, uh, that, that place was really something. That, that uh, you know, and, and Curtis and Lewin, they used to run a great territory. Uh, you know, it wasn't, the, it wasn't the biggest money area, but we would make good money and, and be able to sit. But they'd always make sure, you know, try and, you know, keep the boys happy. All the time, we're, uh, and they'd work back and forth. Where Mark was the heel, I mean, and Curtis was always the baby face. And they, you know, the guys would have their, you know, whatever they needed to get by, and they'd know what's going on in guys' lives, and you know, and uh, try and soothe everything out and make make you know life livable while you're on the road with them, you know. So. Hmm. I'll tell you what, I'm, gonna, I'm even gonna, I'm even gonna tell you what I'm not gonna ask you. I had so much here. Let me have a look. It was. Bobby Heen and Pat Patterson, Ray Stevens, uh, everything I was going to ask you, but one thing I will ask you just before the a, uh, just for a move on from AWA, did Vern Garnier ever try and get you to marry his daughter? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I was, uh, I was, I was, I never even met his daughters. I don't think at the time. Oh yeah, no, I was just a uh, babe in the woods in those days. I used to go out. I used to work out at the ranch, though. He had a barn. He had a farm out in. Uh, outskirts of Minneapolis. And that's where they used to, in the, in the barn there, he had a ring. That's where he trained all the guys. The, he had a, so the one last school before I, I was, I go down and help Billy out. And, and, you know, it's a typical wrestling school where they, the guys, they did, you know, do 500 squats, 500 push-ups. They, they run a couple miles and, you know, do practice a bunch of bumps and stuff. And then they bring, an old time shooter or something into wrestling. <laughs> but by that time, they, you know, they can't even drink water by themselves. You know, but you know, the guy would come in and, and they'd, they'd stretch the guys and, you know, as they're going, but then they, and the class, the, fun, the best, funniest, funnest class I had there was uh, Iron Sheik, Ken Patera, Jimmy Brunzel, Greg Gagne, and a guy named uh, Bobby Bruggers, an ex foot, ex pro football player. And um, we we're, were training those guys. And, um, you know, bumps and stuff. Then Billy would break off into his routines. But they would love it when I would show up by myself. Because when I'd come, we'd, we'd, I would, we'd just, we'd do professional wrestling. 
I couldn't beat anybody anyway. So we just, you know, we're good. Tackle, hip toss, drop down, get it again, headlock, take me over. We just go through, you know, sequences of, uh, of and they love, you know, they, they didn't get a chance. They spent the rest of the week, they spent getting the hell kicked out of them. And when I was there, it was, oh, wow, you know, Broncos here. <laughs> we can take it easy. For the <laughs> it wasn't taking it easy, but just, you know, uh, learning learning on the spot there. Flair, they mentioned Flair was in that group. Yeah. Yeah. Was Steamboat in one of those groups as well? Uh, could have later, later on, maybe. I, I think uh, I think Richard Blood was, but that was I, I left there. I couldn't take Minneapolis. Snow killed me. I, the the money was great, but I just I, I just couldn't hate living there. It still makes me I laugh. As real, it still makes me laugh. His real name is Dick Blood. <laughs> still, it still gets me that one. Yeah. Uh, and I will I will actually ask one, uh, ask one more AWA question. Do you remember when you got there and you saw Vern Garnier, and he was in the midst of a seven year title reign? And surely it's like a young up and coming. You must have looked at him and thought, "This guy's a hundred years old. Why is he the champion?" Or did he still have like the respect and the fan following, uh, you know, to keep the belt on him? He was still a tough old bird, you know. He, he didn't. Uh, he was the boss, and you know, it was. I'd been around enough to know, you know, why he was a champion and why, you know, it, it, when you're a champion, you, get, you know, you take a champion, you need somebody you can trust and somebody you can, uh, you know, you can rely on to, you know, that's gonna that you can build around. So you just can't give it to anybody that may, you know, may come or may, may go on you. So he, he, he held on to it and deservedly so in, in the fifties and sixties, I guess he was, you know, he was an incredible athlete, you know, a, a tough guy like the Thez or the other guys, and, but, but, you know, a smaller stature, but, but, you know, noted to be, you know, a tough guy anyway, you know, a good, good wrestler, a uh, rugged guy. And uh, I actually met him in Hawaii. So I, I lost the mystique in a down Macaw Beach, teaching him how to surf and stuff, you know, helping him, you know, with the, and uh, his daughters were around. No, I never, no, I was never, uh, never pointed in that direction. So you could have got a world title run out of it. Yeah, yeah. Zabisco <laughs> did well. I think he's still married to the daughter. Yeah, I think he is. Uh, if He is, yeah. because he actually spoke to him about a month ago. Yeah. He's a fun guy as well. Yeah, he's a good guy. Right, so I'm going to skip ahead. All of Florida's gone. I'm not going to ask you anything from Florida, so we're going to go straight to the WWF. And oh, of boy. all the questions uh, that I'd written down, I didn't even ask about Mr. Fuji. The first one I actually wrote about for the WWF was, you must have a good drunken Captain Lou Albano story. Oh, my God. Or, or 10. Or 10. Well, I should tell you, I've I, I, I spoken many times about, we'd go to... Uh, Usually it was a garden show on Monday, but if not, some something else. So from there, we'd go to Allentown Tuesday and, Pen and Hamburg, Pennsylvania on Wednesday. And that's where we did three hours of TV in Allentown and three hours in Hamburg. And we all out, all, all the day previous to the, the three hours of shooting that night, we would do interviews and they were, they would bicycle around all the, uh, all the different markets from Philadelphia to Boston to, Washington DC to New York to you know Pittsburgh all around the small towns in, in in between that so we're we're doing interviews all day you know to so 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 Lou would start with glasses cups he'd, he'd get cu paper cups of vodka and he'd start with his bottle of vodka and he'd uh, have one would be vodka one would be water then water and vodka seven up seven up and vodka he'd end up with about six or seven cups there. And he's, and he's drinking out all the cups, you know, eventually, you know, no, not a lot of food or whatever. He'd, he'd get a little buzz going on in there. So, so normally the, the, that was that Tuesday was, was a payoff day. They'd, they'd catch up with you, or at least so they, they'd catch up with the managers. A lot, they used to pay off uh, in the towns that not a lot of the, they'd settle up with you in cash, Jersey or New York, or a lot of the towns that were, that were, that we were wrestling back in the, the original days of, of the old WWF. They settled up, so you'd hear they, the the managers would be getting the be getting getting paid, and you'd hear Lou starting to get get a little loaded. Dead Irish son of a, yeah. and then you know, like, that no good Irish. Dead, 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 dead. Dead, 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 dead. So then by the end of the night, he's he's fine. He's doing. So he goes up. Well, yeah, you know, 
no, you know, obscene, obscenity, extra bleep, bleep, bleep. You know, you're cheating on it. You know, taking all the money and everything else, and then there, and invariably, half the team get fired, and one day you come back like a puppy dog to get hired again. And after that Wednesday, after that Tuesday show, they had uh, you'd have to get invited. It's called the King's Table, where the the bookers and uh, some guys, and they'd ask you back uh, some of the top guys to come and, and uh, to eat at the, at the table. And they'd always, you know, you, whatever you wanted. And New York, Pennsylvania, they'd have you know great, uh, huge selections. So Lou would get three lobster tails, three lobster tails, and the big big thing of butter and sitting there all, all loaded and he'd rip the log and he'd be holding the lobster tail out and go and he'd stiff the lot and he'd be eating like a like a corn dog. Just be eating the lot and he'd just he'd be dipping. Oh my God. That was the inspiration of for all my that meatball sandwich that that uh, that, that that got me uh, <laughs> got got me rolling into because after after we came out of the after I came out of the, the singles matches with Jimmy we were breaking off into a tag match, me and Lou and Jimmy and Buddy Rogers. So my impression of the meatballs was I was, I was trying to be, I was trying to be like Lou, you know, and, and eating meatballs and, and, and drinking soda and stuff like that, you know, and, but you know, he was just a character. It was all, all the time, just to, you know, he, he turned on. And then I from Tony Altamore, the guy was his, uh, his partner. He said, away from that, after the, that Tuesday, Wednesday, or after a night in the garden, he was like a little puppy then with his wife and kids. He was, he was as meek as a little lamb. Our first time up from, from Florida, they brought a bunch of Bob Armstrong, myself, uh, Robert Fuller, Mike Graham. They brought a, about a half a dozen baby faces up and they're opening the uh, Spectrum in Philadelphia. The big, uh, the big, I think they got rid of it since just in the last 10 years but they're opening the spectrum in Philadelphia. So the inaugural match, they had an inaugural battle Royal in that. And, and uh, Lou had a feud going on. We didn't know what was going on, but Lou had a feud going on with somebody. And I think he was managing Bobby Duncan or somebody at the time. So he had a feud, you know, against uh, whoever the baby face Duncan was with, which was the champion, but something else. But, but Lou had something where he's getting color in the battle Royal and everybody that got near, near Lou got, got, got cut. And my first, I think my first blade job was in, was in, uh, was in Philadelphia in the Spectrum in that Battle Royal. And Lou had blades all over his fingers. He'd have the razor blade with him, a pocket knife. I mean, you know, he, he was good for, he was good, good to go. Did, just you have, with did you have the honor of like working maybe a singles match with him or working as a tag with him and seeing firsthand that bah! thing going on? Oh, yeah. Stand in the middle of the ring. <laughs> But you didn't work till he pulled out the straight edge razor. <laughs> he cut, he cut his cheek. He cut his cheek. He's got his. He stick his tongue. He said, "Look, and with all he had the rubber bands and stuff on his. Uh, he he stick look. Right, here. He stick his tongue to the side of his his, his cheek. It's like Butcher Brannigan in Australia. He would uh, he says, look how deep I have to cut. He goes, and he ripped it apart. Another fucking eight <laughs> oh. stitches worth. Jesus Christ." Genius, genius. How he made friends with Cindy Lauper on that airplane, I have no idea. I, I would have been looked at him and think, oh, dude, can you move my seat? Oh, he was, no, in person, he was, uh, he, he was, yeah, in person, he was enthralling, you know, entertaining individual, he, jokes and things and talking. You know, later on, it's like he, he was, uh, he was an enchanting guy to, you know, get, get locked up with. He'd tell you stories and, there's stories about his mom, you know, then we wanted to get the artificial hip or something. She was like 80 something years old and said, what am I going to do in 10 years? Said, don't worry mom. Don't worry about 10 years. Get it now. You're 80 years old. You know? <laughs> but yeah, he, he, uh, he was an entertaining cat. You know, he, he could, he could talk, he could talk to your ears off. <laughs> uh, do you know, I'm going to skip even more. Uh, I was going to ask about the grand wizard. Let's forget about that because there's someone I really want to know more about. And, He's someone else who I don't think really gets his just due, despite the fact that he was WWF, WWF champion for years with Pedro Morales, who you beat for the IC title, I believe. Good man. Real good man. Uh, pleasure to be in the ring with. I met him here before I got into the business. When he was, uh, he came back here to Hawaii and he stayed 18 months. He had some shows in, in Los Angeles 
and, and flew a couple times to uh, San Francisco, Shire's territory, and Carl Palace shows and stuff. But he had come back from a tour in Australia where uh, uh, an old wrestler, Buddy Austin, was, uh, they, they used to stay down at King's Cross there, the Texas Tavern in, uh, in Sydney. And um, evidently, Buddy got, in, got into some uh, hot water with, uh, with a, a local uh, 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 cr uh, crime figure, local, I, well, you know, I wasn't there, just stories, but a local, uh, you know, criminal thing, a gang leader or whatever. Pedro stepped into, you know, was, you know, was and they got, they b broke like 30 something bottles on Pedro's face, beer bottles. So he was, he, stayed, he stopped in Hawaii on his way back to the mainland. I think he was, he was in line to get the, um, get in line to get the, the WWE, WWF title at the time, but he had to, uh, you know, he took that complete detour to, he had to get a whole series of plastic surgery. It wasn't as extensive or as, as, uh, as done as well as they do it now. So it, it took him a longer time. You know, to, to, to work it out. And he stayed here in Hawaii like 18 months. And I see him down at the Dean Hall gym and working out all this time. So I, I knew him before I got in the business. Why doesn't he get maybe the props that he, uh, maybe a Bruno or a Hogan does then? Because he was champion for years. And as far, at least in Madison Square Garden, the New York area, he was maybe even as popular or even more popular than Bruno at the time. Gee, I think, uh, God, I don't know. Um, he, he, he certainly drew, you know, it wasn't, he didn't have any problem uh, putting butts in seats, you know, he, he drew. Um, Vince Sr., before Vince, he had, he liked the, he liked the racial component and he, he liked to, liked to appear to like Bruno and Italian Americans, uh, Pedro, Puerto Ricans naturally, you know, so that uh, he liked to have an ethnic quality in his champion wire. How that worked out, I don't know, or why around New York, but that, that's what he liked. How he how he's not, I think he's still respected. I think they've just moved on to uh, you know, it's it's like a they've, they've kind of forgotten the transition or before, aside from Bruno, you know, the or they've kind of eliminated that era. A, a lot of the wrestlers and stuff at that time. Why I don't know, I have no idea. Uh, speaking of uh, it's maybe a bit more in the Vern Garni camp, but uh. Bob Backlund as WWF champion, because I know you were there, or it's actually WWF, I suppose, when you were there. I would look at him and go, he doesn't really strike me as, uh, you know, the face of the company material, uh, you know, in charis you know, charisma. But he was a, an amazing, you know, amateur wrestler. But So what was your opinions when you first saw him? Well, I wrestled many, many hours with him, and he's a gentleman, a great performer, and I love the guy. Terrific. He um, he took a, he took a place in wrestling. He took a place, he, he, a role which which really was good good amateur background, good wrestling background. Um, didn't cause any trouble. Didn't and he was he was just a tremendous role model, which was when you look back in the eighties, you know the the, the 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 times and and the and the uh, different groups and categories of people that hippies and you know um bikers or you know whatever 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 uh groups were out there he was kind of like really solid mainstream and he was uh, he was uh he, he was a, he was a good he was a good foundation that you could run your company on it, they had they were surrounded they they surrounded him by so much talent that he didn't really need the baby faces didn't need that type of personality in order to draw what you talk about Bruno and Pedro and Bob, their, their uh, promos were really simplistic and, and, and really easy to understand and just relatable to the, to the common, you know, common people. Where you had heels like myself or Piper or, or you know, the, who were other guys who were represented like by Blassie or the Wizard or, or, or you know, that, that it would, that, and we would, you know, we would supply all, all the, uh, the fireworks and the lightning and brimstone and everything else so that, and, you know, and up and down the card, they had, you know, they had a great, you know, a lot of character, the Japanese or the Valiants or uh, the Samoans, you know, they, you know, there's all kinds of Sergeant Slaughters. There's a, there's a guy, Sergeant Slaughter, 
he never gets mentioned. And I'm curious, is it him and Bill Eadie, the mass superstar? It's funny how they they never get mentioned as great uh, the great performers of of my my era, my time. Which they were in Slaughter. I wonder. I guess because he kind of went to New York and stayed there, went back to Charlotte for a little while, and then ended up stopping. You know, just making home in New York. We had a home in Charlotte, but you know, making making his camp in New York. But those guys, you know, that, that never got, uh, there's a lot of guys from that era that are, they're kind of neglected, you know, probably because they never ate meatball sandwiches. <laughs> uh, just going on Bob again, I've heard a couple of things about him. One is that he's strong as an ox, like mad strong. And two, he was actually really great at drinking, which is like more true of the two. Uh, both. He didn't drink a lot, though. He could do the trick where he could open his throat and he he he, he was strong. He, he could poke his hand and uh, make an extra hole in, in the beer can and they you know chugging and so I guess he could open his throat and just as fast as the beer would enter or the glass would enter it would go down down his throat. So nobody could beat him in a in a you know chugging contest, I guess, you know. So <laughs> but so you know, but he wasn't he didn't hang out at bars. He didn't hang out, he was, you know, he he kept uh, he was really uh Really straight laced, cool guy, intelligent. I never really got known to my last my last tour to Japan, and you know because we were it was back in the kayfabe era, and, and we never you know never you know never really associated or you know talked outside of the uh, outside of wrestling you know so maybe around the TV programs or something like that you know but never really had a chance to uh, know one another. Then our, my last tour. One of my last tours in Japan, he was on it, and we had a good we had a good time together. Got to know each other pretty well. As after spending hours and hours in the ring together, you know, he trusted me, and it was uh, all the guys. I think everybody I ever wrestled with, I, they all they all trusted me as, as being a just performer out there to put a show on. I wasn't out out to beat the other, you know, for some reason to slip a fall or catch a you know steal a belt or. You know, I was just out there to, you know, have the best best match possible. Because I know Bob trusted me because we were doing one of those arm series where he, he would pick me up out of a short arm scissors and lift me over my over his head. And I was going a good 250, 260 at the time. They'd, they'd go and drop me again a couple of times. Oh, and you go, got to lay here for a minute, Don. Wait a second. I said, well, what's up? What's up? You know, we're in the hands. Oh, when you came over, you landed on one of my balls. And it hurts. <laughs> I knew right then I could have taken him. You know, I, I knew I knew that the belt would have been mine, but uh, I would have had a belt with no place to work. You know? <laughs> oh, <are> we, <laughs> no, no was, problem. Are we all right just to do a few more questions? I'm really enjoying this. Are we all right to do a couple? Go ahead, more? Yeah, you, drive it I, I got time. Oh, no, good. I, I just, you know, I'm sure you're getting sick well, of the face already. Low, I, it's only eleven o'clock in the morning here, so I'm. Oh, yeah, great, I, I got plenty of time. I'll tell you what, I've got, God, I've got, uh, the amount of research I did on you. Ray Stevens, all right. Ray Stevens questions, Pat Patterson. Oh, do you know what? They, Whatever, WWF. They were so far back as well that I've already gone past them. I mean, I was I was going to ask you loads about snooker as well, but I might just sort of brush over the snooker well, thing. Go ahead, well, whatever. You're... Well, I'll tell you what, one thing I really do want to know, I haven't got my glasses at the moment, and it's sort of all the, all the writing's got smaller. One second. So, uh, obviously, you um, first met Vince McMahon Senior. He brought you in. Uh, when was the first time you met Vince McMahon Jr.? He did the TVs. He was the... Uh, I worked, you know, worked guard and everything else for Senior at the time. And my first run through uh, Senior was was still the boss. But Vince, you know, you know, people don't like him because of what he's done to wrestling or whatever. But he used to run the whole, the, the whole TV Hours and hours, out, just out of an ear, out of an earphone, that he ran, and all the interviews and stuff. He'd stand there with everybody through the whole after afternoon, doing a number, of, you know, dozens and dozens of interviews with everybody for, you know, you'd have four or five segments per town, or three, three to five segments per town, you know, coming this week to Scranton, Pennsylvania, you know, this and Magnus from Morocco and Ricky Steamboat and our interviewing Morocco, now we're in Steam, you know, another segment, Steamboat, and it's uh, the other half of the main event will be the world champion so-and-so, and he'll be wrestling this time. 
So you know, he'd run all those towns down for, you know, or the tag team, whatever, whatever it was with the managers and whatever happened to be available in the building at the time. And he would do all, all of those interviews for all those towns when I first got there. And um, so you know, it, was, it was incredible how he, he worked all that stuff together. Do you remember uh, the transition of power? I don't know if it was like around 81, 82, but was, what sort of changed between uh, the senior and junior when uh, junior bought the company? What, was, uh, what were like the big changes and obviously the national expansion and everything? Travel, 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 travel. There was no more. Uh... We used to go on trips, you know, three or four days up to northern uh, upstate New York, uh, Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, finish around Albany on the last, you know, three, four. You know, Arnold Skolan was usually leading the tour. He'd have a busload of baby faces and we'd follow. He knew every restaurant, every restaurant, every little dive, a little hole and great cooking all over the Northeast. So we spend a week up there, you know, three or four days up there and uh, get a couple of motel, you know, a bunch of all day long. Those guys would be in the room playing poker or playing cards, whatever they do. And other guys would be out working out and going around. So it was, you know, it was more come right in those days. And Vince came on. It was, you know, it'd be four or five days in the West Coast, four or five days in the Midwest, four or five days in the Southwest, four or five days in the South. You know, and then with your, you know, you're all really four or five days in Canada, go across Canada, you know, then, then the European tours and everything started coming after that. So, you know, there was, there was a big difference and the money, you know, got to admit the money was good and uh, to, you know, keep to keep the bucks going was, was great. Do you remember, um, did he ever maybe try and change your persona on screen at any point? Maybe say you can't do this, uh, especially maybe when it got more family friendly and it was gearing towards kids. Was there any directives that you used to do that maybe Vince McMahon tried to curtail? Oh, well, when I changed baby face, they were, you know, at the beginning as, as, as a heel, I had uh, pretty much free run, you know, with uh, other problems in Georgia or, or Florida when I was, I would do the eating and stuff on TV and Jerry Briscoe would tackle me on the way, <laughs> on the way to the studio. It was a, if he caught me walking with a sandwich and hiding a sandwich or a couple of donuts or something in my pocket, they didn't, they didn't want that on the TV. And I'd, I'd slip it in somehow and we'd eat stuff. But, <laughs> but I know as a heel, I got to run. Uh, I, I ran pretty much my own, uh, a lot of my own thing, you know, and, and they, were, they were happy for the contributions that everybody made. Back in, you know, it was before it got to the, where it is now with the writers and the, the, the staffs and everything, everybody, everybody kind of had their own, Piper had a personality. This guy, you know, everybody had their slaughter. Uh, everybody had their own persona, their own ideas, and and, and and you know, and everybody was able to exist like that. Then we got on a bigger stage, and with bigger TV, and you know, naturally you had to bring bring in a bigger staff, and then, then it, then, you know, then it kind of changed. Uh, because you brought up your uh, baby face, I'll, so I'll skip forward and ask this: Did Vince McMahon specifically ask you to shave your chest and beard, uh, chest hair and beard? No, no, I was just part of it. It was, you know, everybody else was doing it and seemed to be the right thing. You know, the, I'd gotten cut up and, and been working out a lot, you know, it changed, uh, changed physically a little bit. So, and, you know, it stood up and I was, uh, I was hanging around with the Bulldogs a lot in those days with the Dynamite and Davy Boy. So, you know, those guys, they were, it was, you know, those are, those are good times. I won't ask what else you were doing apart from hitting the gym. I mean, a lot of partying, at least. Those guys were those guys were wild. They got uh, they, well. They picked up from Fuji. You know, they they got uh, Fuji was the uh, the grand poobah for playing ribs and cutting guys' hair and shaving eyebrows and stuff like that. So the Davy Boy and Dynamite got got right into that. So they're 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 classics as well. <laughs> was uh was dynamite? Did dynamite get like a bit meaner towards the end? Because I've heard stories that maybe the pranks and everything were getting a bit more salty and and rough than uh, maybe at the beginning of their tenure in the WWF. I don't know if they're meaner. He was always oh they were always I guess you know there's a lot of stories from up the, up in what they used to do up in Calgary, the guys up in Calgary there. So I, I think uh, it was pretty tame. Uh, they're run with the they're they're running with the Ruchos. I I don't know, 
I didn't, you know, I kind of in one night he came in and uh, challenged me you know, if they wanted to, and once they didn't want to, and then they got him a week or so later, you know, so. But, uh, yeah, they were all, you know, uh, they'd find a guy, Outback Jack. <laughs> you know, uh, I've he already written him down. That's exactly what he was going to ask. They were always, they were always cutting his pants and cutting the legs off his pants and cutting his clothes up and doing all kinds of stuff. He was a, he was a good guy. He was, uh, he was an Aussie and he always going, you know, I remember Iron Sheik and I were in San Francisco. Iron Sheik and I are going out. There's a me Mexican restaurant that stayed open a little later and we, we could have made it. So we're coming back through the lobby. We're staying in the Holiday Inn. And the, he and Fuji were down in the down in the, the lobby, the, the the bar area, the cocktail area. We, we stopped and talking to them, you know, have a beer. And he, and, you know, we're sitting with Fuji. You know, so, so and he goes, "Wow, ah, you Yankee blokes, you don't drink like, like us Australian fellas." So, oh boy, here it goes. You know, so that's that's all right, uh, brother, brother. You know, you got the H bomb, the Halcyon. So they got the, so we we took off with. We Went and ate ate uh, ate, a, ate, a, ate a nice dinner at one of the Mexican chain places right up the road from the Holiday Inn. Then coming back in a taxi, I looked at the Holiday Inn is surrounded with blue lights. The police uh, the police lights going off. So oh my God, what Fuji do? <laughs> Just so he got back there, the cops and everybody standing around, and he had uh, uh, some way. I guess a couple of sleeping pills had found their way into um, uh, Outback Jack's uh, beer and uh, shots and beer and pills and more beer and more beer and more shots. Uh, I guess he went back to his room and he went back to his room. He took his clothes off, went to sleep. For some reason, he got up and started to walk, decided to walk the hotel looking for a hamburger or something. And his wife, he was walking around the hotel, completely oblivious in a, in a, in a, in a, in a trance. But completely obedient you know, stay with what are you doing? Don't 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 fool with me. You know, you know, he didn't even, you know, just saw you by a just walking around the hotel completely nude without a stitch of clothes on. But finally, you know, kind of ushered him back, kind of around like a ushering a, a cow into to his pen, kind of got him back into his room and shut the door and you know. Oh <laughs> Mr. Fuji. <laughs> Were you uh were you there when um I've heard the story I think from Greg Valentine where they glued Outback Jack's hat to his head on an air uh, on a flight? No, no. Oh well, I think I might I think I might have given away the punchline to it then, so I won't go <laughs> I won't go into that anymore. Uh, right, I will go back slightly. Oh, oh God, there was something I really wanted to ask you as well. Oh God, I'll have to go back slightly. Do apologise. Do apologise. Yeah. Um. So. Back on again, and Jimmy Snooker. Uh, when was the first time you met him? Because I, I doubt it was in the WWF. He was training. Uh, Cowboy Frankie Lane was wrestling in Hawaii when I came back, when I first came back. So Cow uh, Cowboy was training. He was he used to work out, like I said, down at Dean, Dean Aguchi's gym. In Waikiki were all the, all the wrestlers and people going through. We, we used to train. So he was uh, he was like a Mr. Hawaii, Mr. Hawaiian Islands. He was a championship bodybuilder hmm. from Hawaii. And... Um, then he, then he broke in, you know, about a year or so after I did. So he was in the, you know, in the, what was that, early 70s? 70, 71, he started. So that, you know, that, that's a, and then we'd, we'd, we'd cross paths eventually. In Minneapolis, AWA, we were actually a tag team, Lonnie K. Aloha. They wanted a Hawaiian name. Vern Gagne wanted to, and I didn't know, you know, any kind of Hawaiian names that would make any sense, you know, to, to people, you know, and the, uh, you know, like trying to give you, you know, like uh, give somebody in England a Hawaiian name, that, you know, that, that, you know, just try and have some type of continuity with the Hawaiian language, you know, that did not, not go real deeper, you know, something confusing. So, Alani Kale, he didn't like it. You know, Jimmy like wanted to go as Jimmy Snook. I said, hey, I, he wanted a Hawaiian name. I don't know, you know. So that's uh, we're tag team. We're a pretty good tag team too. Mm -hmm. In the, in the AWA, I think we're only like uh, the Crusher and the Bruiser were there at the time, and we we're like uh, right right behind them. Of course, we had you know Stevens and uh, Bachwinkle and uh, 
Bobby Heenan, Rene Goulet. We had we were in Henning and uh, who was Larry's partner? I don't remember Larry's. Harley partner. Rice at one point. Lars was gone. Yeah, but Harley before that. And then when I first came in, it was Lars. But I think Lars went, went to uh, San Francisco for Shires. I forget who Larry took as a partner after them. Would everybody be standing around if we were somewhere in the locker room or something complaining about Vern or leaving Larry? Come on, he walked back and he said, damn it, I just gave Vern my 20 year notice. He, was, he wasn't going anywhere. <laughs> He's staying right in Robbinsdale. He went to, uh, he went to a short run in, in uh, New York with the, the champ Bruno or whoever the champ was at the time. And then came right back to Minnesota. Was really was did. Jimmy like always like totally off the wall, crazy, unstable, or did or you know was he like really calm when you first met him and then sort of developed into that later on? He was always calm. He was you know, I, I I know him. He was you know he, he was he just, you know you'd have a good time, but he was really calm. Other guys, uh, I guess Piper had you know Piper had a hard time with him. Have you done pop Piper before? You interviewed Roddy? No, no, I'm I'm quite new at this. Unfortunately, I never got the oh, opportunity. I see. Yeah, well, Piper obviously passed, but I get you know Roddy had uh, he and Roddy had a, a rough sailing when they they had a big angle at, you know uh, uh, in WWF at the time and that that that, that ran and, and uh, I guess they had a lot of turmoil behind the scene. Why I have no idea. I I was in the, I left. I was in Atlanta for about six months and and then came back, which is unusual, kind of a change in the territory wasn't used to at the time for top heels. We would come in, work with a champion, then work with somebody on the way out, do about a six month run, and they wouldn't come back for another couple of years. But this this was the turn of the uh, WWF into slowly later uh, becoming WWE when uh, Vince Jr. took it over. So how come you two work just so absolutely well together? Because I mean I've I've gone back, I've seen the interviews where you just <sighs> You know, he's super cocky. You know, you can beat him any day of the week. And Jimmy Snooker with the most oddly compelling interview uh, promos where he'd sort of whispering and then he'd forget what he was saying and then he just yells something immediately. But somehow it just completely worked. I mean, did I mean, uh, Jimmy's interviews for starters. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, we knew that. And so we I think after the the close thing and then the weekend, week after, we uh, he, he did a like a generic to insert in all the uh, insert in all, in, uh, on all the, the, the tapes that went out I just that be part of the regular body TV where he was sitting uh, in the in the ringside in the, with the chairs in an empty arena with uh, with Vince uh, going off you know and, and then at the end he, he got uh, he got heated and started throwing chairs around and stuff but dude, we thought it'd be evil rather than, than hitting him with you know 20 30 interviews a day, Having him try and go, go, you know, which really wasn't that much for a baby face because baby faces. I remember Pedro's, Pedro's, uh, ah, I'm happy to be in the, the city of Boston, baby. I have many amigos and many good friends. It's a beautiful city, beautiful place. And he that was pretty much, you know, Bruno, pretty much the same thing. You know, all the Backlund and all the baby faces uh, could get away with pretty much a, a generic uh, kind of interview. And Jimmy could have too, but he got, uh, you know, he'd been a heel for quite some time. So I, I suppose, you know, he, he enjoyed that, that aspect too of, of wandering off script, you know. Hmm. How come? Uh, and I know, I'm, and I will touch on this. I know it's a bit of a dark subject and everything, but I'll, I'll mention it in a bit and you know what I'm going to say is why did Jimmy never wrestle the belt off you? Even at the famous cage match where he jumped off, hit you, that was already after the match was over, wasn't it? So how come he never yes. ended up be, uh, being the champion? It was inconvenient at the time, and, and you you got to you got to know that when you get a belt, you're going to lose the belt. See, um, Jake the Snake had a snake. Jimmy had the dive and the Polynesian. Uh, all these guys, they 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 had things. They didn't need a belt in order to make them entertaining or interesting. And, and with a baby face, you don't you know you often you don't need it. So it's it's the the chase the hunt that, that's it's more satisfying you know as a as a babyface you know and getting and then defending the belt because once they have a belt all they can do is lose the belt because you know time goes on whereas a heel you know you're 
basically, if you're a heel and you're in a, you're a professional jobber, and you guys don't like that word, but that's what you are. That's what I was. I did jobs for Hulk. I did jobs for Backman. I did jobs for Snooker. I did jobs for everybody. You know, just all the, every top baby face in the, in the you know, I, I was getting my hand raised a lot, lots of times, but, you know, every, any, when I was a champion, any match I ever won was, you know, I passed out bleeding with, with you know, luckily to get my hand across her shoulder, and, you know, or they, they didn't know they'd gotten beaten. Uh, I'd be, you know, I would, I was beaten down at the end of the match and my, my baby face was usually still looking strong, you know, were, were they going to, and I was as, as like, as in the cage match, I was a champion, but they, you know, I just got squashed by Jimmy off the top of the mm -hmm. cage. You know, so it's a uh, belt is ominous thing. And people don't realize that it's a, it's, it's a thing that, that helps you draw and really it serves a better purpose on a heel. Cause you could, cause you can make a, you can make your, make, you know, if you're a champion, you make your the contenders look better and then you move it around. You, you know, you can move them, move me off of that. I like we talked about the late buddy Colt who just passed a couple months ago in Florida, how he had the, Florida champion. He'd work maybe three or four baby faces with, with that Florida champion. If they fought, found one hot enough, he dropped the title to that, you know, a third, you know, the third guy, or he'd, he'd go on there and, then, and go a couple of weeks and then come up with a half a half a dozen, three or four titles. He'd come up with a Southern title hmm. the next week and then, you know, start all over again hmm. with a different set of baby faces, then lose that and come up with a TV title or something else, you know, North American title. So you, you had a heel like that, but that's what, you know, basically what a heel could do. It, it, you know, you could cycle them around and use them to get your baby faces over. Yeah. Uh, I've heard a couple of different theories of why sort of after the feud with you, the high profile feud with you, he was sort of shunted down the card somewhat. And one is the Nancy Argentino situation. But the other one I actually saw on um, on an old interview with Roddy Piper who said, and he had his dates mixed up slightly, I mean, timelines mixed up slightly, but basically they shunted him down the card a little bit because they just couldn't get him to be less popular than Hulk Hogan. Like Snooker was just beloved. Yeah. Yeah, he was. Yeah. Man, that's, that would, uh, I'm sure that would be a reason they brought him as Hulk tag partner in the first WrestleMania. Uh, seemingly for no reason, just because, well, he, he had a history with Piper, but he was, he was a top guy in the territory till Hulk came, you know, and it was just like Hulk uh, Dino Bravo was uh, was a god in Montreal for years before he came into uh, came into WWF as a heel, and they didn't want to, they didn't want Bravo and Hulk wrestling for the belt in Montreal because they were afraid that Hulk was going to turn it heel. He's going you know, to turn Hulk heel because Bravo you know spoke French, uh, was from 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 Quebec, and was part of them. So they didn't they hesitated uh, giving him. A shot in Montreal. I'll probably skip the rest of the Nancy Argentino thing because it's just depressing, isn't it? But um, one thing I would like to know is Hulk Hogan in 1985, because you went to Hawaii for a bit and then you came back again. Uh, you would wrestle Hulk Hogan in 1985, but actually just before that, why were you not on the first WrestleMania card? Because you were in the territory. George Scott. <laughs> ah. <laughs> George, Scott, George Scott was booking. George Scott was booking the territory at the time. He had, uh, I thought we were great friends. I, you know, he was, he was a friend of Wahoo McDaniels and I met him in AWA and he, he'd been, uh, he and Wahoo were close friends and, and he had, but he went to, uh, Charlotte, uh, mid Atlantic wrestling and he, uh, became the booker over there and they did massive, massive success. Blackjack Mulligan, Flair, Steamboat, Wahoo, uh, you know, on and Anderson, you know, all the names. Valentine, uh, guys I haven't prepared myself for, but you know, great, great number of guys. I, I think, um, I think he was upset with me that I didn't call and ask him for a job. Um, and I was, I was content in Florida. And then, and then I, I I'd always went, would go back to Hawaii. I would, I would burn out. I'd burn out in, in the, in the main mainland United States. I'd have to get back. That's why the, the people mentioned me for the NWA title. I said, I would have never been, I was never worth a damn for the title because I, I couldn't, uh, I didn't like, you know, like flair. I couldn't get on the, get in the plane on Christmas day and fr fly to Puerto Rico and leave my family. I, well, I, you know, I could, anybody can, but you know, I, I didn't, 
I, you know, the, the travel and getting back to Hawaii and living in the mainland U.S. Uh, just, uh, you know, would burn me out. So um, I forget what the initial question was. <laughs> I was uh, why you went on the uh, WrestleMania card. Oh, yeah, George Scott. And, and they... Yeah, George Scott kept me off, and they, 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 they um, the word they told me is that they're going to coming out of that, they're going to need somebody to program with Hulk after that, and because I had been established and I was a heel and blah 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 blah, I was the man. And then and if they were, and if Orndorff wasn't going to want to do the job in the um, in the WrestleMania, they they would they would fall back on me to to be to be Roddy's pipe Roddy's a partner. And, and then, and then the second, uh, you know, and second, and secondly, that I was, I had the privilege of coming out of uh, the first time the garden had sold out in about five years. I had the privilege of coming out, coming out of WrestleMania with uh, Hulk Hogan in the garden, which was, you know, you come to half a house at the garden and say, oh my God. But we built it up to a sellout, you know, but uh, following WrestleMania, it was just, you know, Liberace and Cinder Lauper and, Aretha Franklin singing, you know, God bless America, you know, everything else. Yeah, it was a hell of a thing. And I wasn't on it, no. no we were we backstage, at least, just looking around thinking, damn, I'm missing a, I'm missing a heck of a payoff here. No, no, I, I didn't, didn't happen to go in. Huh? There were so many people would have been, would have been just total confusion trying to find a place to sit, you know, I just, I stayed away. Hmm. So... So uh, how was working Hulk Hogan? Because I've I've heard Hulk himself say I've got four matches A, B, C, and D. Is he just been yeah. self-deprecating, -de or is he actually a lot? Because I always have the theory that he's actually a lot better than people give him credit for. <laughs> yeah, he is. Sure, he is. Um, you didn't need to do much, you know. It was it was. Uh, I always wanted a night off with him. It, you know, just do that. You get, you get your heat. Do you know, whatever. And then go home, you know, it was, it was, uh, or going to, you know, what you're, you're going to come back with the next big show or, or whatever, you know, it was, he was easy to work with. I always found easy, safe, although he did split my whole head open with a chair one night, but you know, he, he was, uh, he was safe. He was, you know, basically safe uh, and, and, you know, and easy to work with. Plus, plus the big plus there, you know, the ching, here you go. <laughs> Of uh, yeah, Madison Square, the main reason, he could have been he could have been a lousy worker. He could have stunk in the ring, but you know, <laughs> when when the the, the old scratcher Rooney came, he was uh, that was the that uh, Eye of the Tiger. That that was that was just my theme song as well. Boy, I loved it. Yeah. Hear him, you know, looking at looking across the ring, facing him. You know, I had a, I had a good payday coming. When um well when you were facing him, let's say Madison Square Garden in a in a full house, what? in theory, roughly, was the payday? If you don't want to say it, you don't have to, but what could you expect on a on a good full house day? Back, back then, about three grand. About right around three grand. Uh, it, was, it was split up. After a while, and they, 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 you know, they, they'd move it around. and uh, But after a while, they, they, they'd work into like a weekly salary. They, they, they'd work it out where, you know, the main event here, that, there. I had a main event with Backlund one time in Washington, D.C., in the middle of a blizzard. Snow up to your, you know, up to your roof, just snow everywhere. I think, oh, it's going to be horrible. I went in half a house. I got the same payoff as I did on a sellout, hmm. and I got a return out of it. So, you know, it, it was uh, it was pretty fair, the, you know, as far as I was getting a lot of the other booking the things were pretty good but, but working with hulk was working with hulk was a night off plus you know it's a money in the bank and a night off it's not a, he didn't do a lot of things you know it's not like you're you know i watched uh stan hansen you're, you're familiar with him. he was yeah. uh you know and, and it was in japan and it was in japan for baba and he was you know he was their light and i watched him with the giant and he had a brilliant match with, with andre in japan but boy did they work hard you know, they were, if I was working with Andre, I was lucky. I was always a coward. So I would be able to back off and beg and, you know, take bumps and get the hell beat out of me. And it wouldn't be a big deal. But if you're somebody like Stan, you know, where you had, you know, where you're look, looked at as being that tough 
rugged guy that he and, and they, he showed up against Andre and it was great. And then next week I happened to be watching another match. But I prepped myself for the making waves. I, I saw another match with him and Tommy, uh, British Bulldog, uh, uh, Dynamite. I saw the next week uh, 10 12 match with uh, Stan and, and Dynamite. And oh my God, two different uh, from the giant. 400 pounds, something pounds, the dynamite 200, two different matches, two complete, but two brilliant matches. You know, so it's just psychology, you know, the things. And, and uh, I never saw Stan Hansen work in the United States. I saw him work in J Japan a few times. And, you know, you don't take much, much account of that. But I, I saw old tapes of him and, uh, you know, he was a tremendous worker. <laughs> but I, I didn't have to do that. You know, I didn't, I could be a coward. I could beg. I thought I got rid of all this beautiful hair of mine. After I, I had to stop shaking my hair and begging for mercy, you know, please don't hit me. <laughs> you know, and big off from the, and I, you know, I had hair flowing all over the place and, you know, somebody punched me and my hair would fly and it is emphasis. But once I turned and I, I left the business, the hair was gone, brother. <laughs> Look, I do, I didn't need to be there, brother. I still got it. <laughs> Dude, you got more than me. You've got more than me, I'm telling you. You've got more than me still. Uh, I'll, I, I will have to ask one. Uh, well, I'll tell you what, I've got a couple more. If you've pretty much had enough of me now, and I'll do no, the big finale. Oh, good there. Right, so um, you were teamed with uh, just, just exigent circumstances because superstar, excuse me, superstar Billy Graham came back in 86, I think, after a pretty long layoff, and then he was down in NWA, completely new look and everything. I'm sure you met him years before, but specifically, do you remember when you were in the WWF and he came back in like the early eighties with this bald head and the karate thing going on. Yeah. 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 He was, he was, uh, yeah, well, he was the hottest thing in New York that they had at the time. You know, he was fantastic. The, 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 the great body, the great interviews, you know, his interviews were still there. And Vince was, I guess Vince was just, uh, the McMahon's fall in love with somebody and they, they they usually fall in love with them for life, no matter what they do. I don't know what like Andre walks on water as far as you know, senior and junior was concerned. Freddie Blassie was another one of them. You know they they got uh, guys that that they uh, that, that you know just I guess you know came to their area, made them a lot a lot of money, and and really got you know were really uh, got really close with the family. So I know senior. And Junior loved the Giant. I forget who we were just talking about. Uh, superstar. Superstar. Yeah. Well, he was. You know, he 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 done he done a great. You know, and Kevin Sullivan. He, his interview with the the senior made uh, one of his biggest mistakes is after about a year and a half with the belt is not uh, not switching baby Billy to a baby because he would have been. You know, boy, that would have. I don't know if the world was ready for it at the time. You know, if wrestling was set up for that type of thing, but, I mean, but his, his interview and his shtick and everything he had, you know, it would, it would have worked for as big as that territory. It would worked. It would have worked for a couple of years because he was just, uh, he, people, people were, you know, his, maybe his ring work or whatever, but he was people enthralled with him. Did he, when he came back with the karate thing, was, was he suffering some sort of, you know, crisis of uh, confidence maybe? Because I know his body shrank a bit at the time. Uh, he was, had liver problems, uh, he had, you know, steroid abuse and, and different things. And he had some demons, you know. He had uh, he had some demons, um, pills and some other stuff that uh, he overcame and, and made him, you know, a stronger person for it. But he, he did run into some some obstacles along the way, and uh, I guess it was just Vince and senior and junior, you know, extending an open hand to try and try and get him back, you know, back on track, which he did for a while. And, and you know, and then moved, moved to Arizona. And... Yeah, and he had a load of tarantulas on his face. I, yeah. I saw the, oh, oh my God. <laughs> when he came back, I mean, uh, I mean, he seemed like full back of the confidence and everything like that. I mean, I, I don't know how well you knew him personally, but I mean, how did he come across to you? I mean, was he a different person than five years ago when he was in a darker place? 
Yeah, he was, his, everything was back. You know, I met him, I first known him in LA territory. When I first went to LA from Vancouver, he was a superstar. He would, they, they had him there with Dr. Jerry. He was, they did have uh, the New York office. Right? We'll go back to the Vince Sr. He loved Jer, uh, Dr. Jerry Graham. And he was a, a big card, him and Eddie. In the 50s, he was a big, uh, big star and everything. You know, he was a big, he was the, he was the man around New York. And guys used to talk about him in the business as being, you know. The, the, so he, he ran, you know, demons and stuff. His mother passed away. He flipped out, went down and grabbed her body out of the mortuary, took it and stuff like, yeah. So, okay. you know, and, and Dr. Jerry was going through his demons as well. And I guess Dusty had him for a while, had dead Dr. Jerry for a while in Amarillo. But he he got uh, he got moved on somewhere. He was uh, they partnered him up. And that's how Billy got the the Graham name. He was they partnered him up with Dr. Jerry, and he was more or less. See Vince, people people didn't know till later is Vince uh, Johnny uh, Johnny Ross, S. T. Jones, a lot of the guys, the, the the staple guys that lived around New York City and stuff worked worked. Uh, Vince would send him out there to L.A. for Mike LaBelle. And they would work, and Vince would give him a guarantee of maybe 500 a week, just in rough. I don't know what the guarantee. I'm just, for instance, a 500 guarantee. And they would make their money in LA, which wasn't no money to make in LA. You know, 25, 50 bucks a night if you're lucky. And they they would make their they would make their payoff in LA. But uh, Vince would always supplement it. So he he came out. So Vince, uh, so they had their eye on Billy. Long before that, then after that, he went to AWA, uh, superstar with Wahoo, and, and all those that uh, feud they had over there, and uh, which was a big one in AWA at the time. First with the strap matches and the bull rope matches, and everything else before, you know, he really he went to uh, New York and got the belt. But uh, he came back. He was working out with Arnold uh, in uh, Southern California at the old Gold's Gym and stuff. And uh, yeah, he, he's a legend. I remember bodybuilding and Arnold and those guys. Arnold helped him out a lot too. It, it, Arnold did, did help him later, you know, in later years as well. Got him on the the, the president's um, where you go around to schools and drug drug talks and stuff like that. That he'd abused drugs and had pictures of his liver, how how crusty his liver had become, and, and, and stuff like that. You know, so he went around and but I, I I don't Bush or some well, whoever the president was. At the time, you know, they, they enlisted Billy as a as an ambassador, as it'd be, you know, around to schools and youth programs and stuff like that. Hmm. I, I will, uh, once again, I'll do you a couple more, a big finale, and then I will not darken your door anymore. Um, but one thing, I mean, you were at Stampede, AWA again, uh, All Japan. Throwing all those out the window, I've got to ask you this one. Herb Abrams, uh, UWF. What, oh, yeah. what was that? Yeah, your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> My room, uh, Jim Brazel told me his wife, uh, his wife was from Hawaii, is or I don't know if she's, I don't know. And I think she was a Filipino lady. And he got like a uh, hundred American Express cards. They applied for American Express cards all over and they're accepted. Then he maxed out the cash. Cath was withdrawal on all the all the cards. So he was operating on three, four, five hundred grand. I don't know what what he was bankrolling. But uh, somewhere in his cocaine dreams there at one time, he saw himself replacing Vince McMahon Jr. and the WWF. Or as he rented a building right across from Madison Square Garden. I think it was called the Penta Hotel. And uh, I my wife was working uh with a travel agent at the time. So I was getting flights and stuff. And the first couple of the first, I, I think I did three, three trips for him and three, uh, three shows for him. And um, he was nuts. I was before he started with the hookers and uh, turning on the fire alarms in the hotel and running around, you know, when, when he, when he finally passed and killed himself there. But uh, yeah, he was, uh, he was a little guy, uh, Napoleon, Napoleonic complex, um, ethnic man, F this guy, we're taking over here. We're, you know, we're, I'm running New York now. You know, been there, done that, seen him. 
seen the seen the guys, seen all the seen all the you know seen a lot of the guys that were going to going to replace the McMahons and uh, still see them. <laughs> You must, you must have, uh, when you first walked in there, and I don't know if you're in the same maybe taping as Andre the Giant, and I know Bruno San Martino was there, Captain Lou, uh, so many, uh, Bob Orton, so many names. You must have been looking around and going, y- you couldn't have possibly thought this is the guy who's going to take on Vince McMahon, but you must have thought, we've got ourselves a money mark here, and rubbing your hands together. Well, not the way, I, if, you know a couple of those guys were spies. Some guys, <laughs> you know, you know some, some guy, Andre or somebody must have been a, been a spy for him and had to be sucking, uh, sucking some of the money out of his business because they all charged. Bruno, ch- Bruno always charged. Andre charged full price. You know, Lou would charge full price, and he was paying. He was paying the other guys like uh, whether it be Steve Williams, Bob, um, Mick Foley, uh, even Tolis came in as a manager for a while. So I, I think he, I think he was high rolling with a bunch of the bunch of guys and, and paying money till. He ran out and started bunching checks on everybody. Hmm. Well, I was, was going to be my next question. D- did you uh, did you get a bounce check off him? I got no. I got. I ended up getting. I only worked. I only worked for him the first two or three times. So he was still uh, the second. The, the final check I got took a while to clear. I did, actually, but uh, it finally did, and I, it's the first time I'd, I'd taken a check from an independent guy. But it got. Uh, it, it finally passed. <laughs> you can't have been that surprised when you heard, oh, Herb Abrams has blown himself away, covered in grease, uh, cocaine up no. his face. No, no. No, that wasn't, uh, seemed like it was headed for a, for a bad ending. <laughs> uh, my last of the normal questions, I'll go into the uh, the uh, main event and then we will uh, carry on. But uh, uh, ECW, uh, was that just like another gig at the time? I mean, or did you really see anything special at the time or was it just... Maybe another UWF at the time you thought maybe. I was basically retired by then. I I uh, I was a longshoreman. I think you call them Morphies <laughs> yeah. uh, in New Zealand. Yeah, They're, I don't know if England is the same thing. In New Zealand, I, I become Dockers. a longshoreman. We call them Dockers. Dockers, yeah. I was I was a longshoreman, and I ended up a clerk down there. But I, I was a labor uh, regular gang member. For a good ten years, ten or twelve years, I was on the docks for twenty-five years. After and, and I'm still doing some wrestling gigs. Went to Japan, went to Australia, uh, went, went on a couple of tours. But uh, was basically, uh, you know, uh, just wrestling here and there. So that's how I got ACW. Bob Ortiz was an uh, announcer. He runs the uh, ice rink. Up in Philadelphia, he was announcing for Todd Gordon, and um, he said, "Well, he told Todd, I think I can get Brock away." So great. Well, you know, he used me. I, I took the strap off of somebody and passed it to somebody else. Pretty much the same with Cal- Calgary. I, I went up there and uh, Mark and Singh had the belt, and I I took the belt off of him, and then and then dropped it to uh, Davy Boy a couple weeks later. Uh, well, dropped it went. Went back home to Jersey for a couple in you know, a month, and came back in uh, another another round. Dropped the belt to Davy, so they wanted the belt to, on Davy. So that was you know just a passing. <laughs> so no, you weren't looking at ECW and thinking no, this is the no. this is the next uh, big territory. Know, no, once you've been involved, once you come from the WWF, yeah, you you, you you knew pretty much everything else was just make believe. <laughs> you know, all these everybody else is just you know. They're talking, you know, the, the other guys, there was a guy uh, on Making Wave Show and he's supposedly starting a, a wrestling uh, wrestling uh, federation. And I asked him, I'd like to hear, you know, what the, they're talking about. But you got to be ready to throw, you know, $10, $20 million just at a loss for, you know, six months to a year. You just got to look at money, you know, losing money for till you get yourself established in your TV shows and everything else. And then maybe, maybe you can do business. You know, it's a, there's a big maybe when you could, because the, the WWF with their TV and their, their di- distribution and everything else is just uh, so strong and, and so tight. It's got everybody tied up so well. Yeah. I, I suppose with, um, when you were there in 92, 93 ECW, 
they were still in the bars and the you know they were still doing like bar wrestling and stuff, weren't they? Yeah, bars and that uh, that that building that they converted in Philadelphia, that uh, that building that they became famous, mm. with the New Jack and all the crazy stuff they used to do. Right, I'm going to go into the absolute finale now, and I'm so happy that you spent so much time with me, and the dog's even happy as well. Uh, so my yeah. my uh, uh, my final gambit is uh, I call it the firing line. I'm going to fire at you some names. You just tell me if they're cool, not cool. There's a little funny story. I know we're obviously really tight for that time. We've gone way over, but I'm going to give you maybe a dozen or so names, and you tell me uh, what you think of them. And the first one is Playboy Buddy Rose. Great talent. Great talent. Uh, lost lost to his demons. It was a great talent. I remember him. Uh, George Kodaski used to let him set up the ring when he was uh, Paul Pershman. He used to drive to set up the ring for uh, George Kodaski. And then if, after he did, because uh, he'd do it for free, he'd let him work out in the ring. And I, I'd watch him take, you know, he'd take beautiful bumps, have great matches. And he wasn't even, uh, before he even, before he was even, if Vern saw that, he would have pulled the rest of his hair out. Or he would have pulled, he would have pulled, Buddy's, he would have pulled Buddy's hair out. And Gadaski's. Uh, Mill Mascaris. Good guy. Protected his mask. Angelo Mosca and I were always teasing him. He, he'd always have his mask on. And, you know, so he'd hey, Aaron, you know, and his name or, you know, or when he'd be up in a restaurant or something, he'd be, hey, Mill. And they just, you know, Mexican wrestlers, they, 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 their mask is an extension of their their body. He, he was he was good though, good talent, big star in Mexico, <laughs> big big movie star, wrestling star, Los Angeles, Mexico. All the Latinos loved him. Uh, Larry Zabisco, good guy, good guy. Never was around. He was in Georgia for a little while. Um, I think he came out of. I don't know if he. I don't think he. He the. Uh, I think it was pre. Before the, before he turned on Bruno, but he was, he was funny guy. He'd uh, ride with him. He had the, he liked the Frank Sinatra and the, the big band music. You know everybody else's, the rock and roll. He was he was a East Coaster, East Coast fella, but good guy, talented. Turned out to be a great, uh, great interviewer, great promo man, and a good man in the ring. <laughs> Uh, we already uh, established Outback Jack earlier, so I'm going to skip straight on to uh, Dennis Stamp. Oh, he was a guy. I worked out with. He, he had the ring. I was in Minneapolis. I uh, trained. He and uh, Nick Buckman, the younger, younger brother, uh, were breaking in at the same time. And Dennis was a good amateur from uh, North Dakota. And um, I'd, I'd, I'd go someplace and then I'd hang around with the ring guy because they were the only guys my age. Everybody else was, you know, Robinson or Bachwinkle or Larry. They all had, you know, old had families and, you know, in the mid, mid to late middle thirties and stuff. And I was, I was just in my early, just, just turned 20, you know, barely a 20, 21, barely, barely legal drinking age. So I, I ended up hanging around with those guys and the Dennis Bachwinkle and he had the ring or a ring for, for Vern. So, you know, he was a, he turned into a good, he was a good wrestler. He just didn't uh, went more on the wrestling and stuff. Never wanted to go with the body. And of course, in those days, it wasn't a body. But you know, cosmetics cosmetics are always uh, are always always welcome, especially when drawing money. And he didn't want to uh, he didn't want to go that route. Uh, speaking of uh, uh, barely legal drinking, Shane McMahon. He was a kid. I, I don't I don't know I. Spoke with him. He was around. He wasn't a brat. Uh, he was respectful for the guys, you know. Um, he hadn't asserted himself. Like I said, he was he was really young and he wasn't really much, you know. He was he was just standing around watching at the time. So I really had no no. Uh, he just seemed like a good kid. Uh, Greg Garnier. He was all right. Yeah. Um, you know, working in a huge shadow it was a good, uh, good performer, good guy. Uh, it's hard, you know, when you're one of those guys, you know, Mike Graham, another one, when, when you're, you know, your, your dad's the boss, it's kind of hard. It's hard to, uh, hard to get over with the guys, you know, because, you know, you're not one of the, you, you want to be one of the guys, but you're not really, you know, 
your, your, your still office and you, and you, your office and your dream. So that's, you know, you get two strikes on you right there, but he was, he was a good guy. We, I went we went around, uh, went out a few nights. He, you know, I was, uh, in Minneapolis and a few places. He was a good time. It turned out to be a hell of a worker. Um, Another guy that wasn't into bodies, so he, he remained on the kind of the lean side. But you know, he was his daddy. It was his daddy's football, yeah. so he got to play with as much as he wanted. Yeah. He he wasn't quite a daddy said sell like uh, was it George Goulas or was it Nick Goulas? I can't, no, it's George Goulas, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. Um, we have J uh, Chief J Strongbow. Oh, uh, I. You know, boring. I don't have a lot of <laughs> I don't have a lot of bad things to say about a lot of these guys. Uh, Jay was a he was a he was an office agent, and, and he'd work you know he'd, he'd work matches as as well, but he, he took care of the uh, took care of the locker rooms, took care of the office. Uh, not much in the promos, but, but you know it was around uh, giving out finishes and uh, one one of the uh, an agent on the a road agent, good guy. Never kept himself, you know. He wasn't uh, not a drinker, not 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 a not a out at night guy, you know. Very, very quiet. When I knew him, I, he was you know older by the time I met him. Hmm. So maybe earlier he, he was alone. Uh, Norman Frederick Charles the Third. Which one's that? Uh, Royal Kangaroos. I think he teamed with Jonathan Boyd for a oh, while. Oh, I didn't. Uh, I didn't know. I, I a little spent some time with John Boyd. I didn't know those guys real well, the kangaroos. I didn't, uh, they were, they spent more time in Detroit. And, um, I think we're in, uh, San Francisco for a little while. I, I didn't, I didn't know those gentlemen very well. Okay. They, they seemed like good guys. I, I never heard anything bad about them. Yeah. He's repping Manchester for me as well. So that's good. Uh, uh Joe LaDuke. Great guy. Great guy. Um, we had a we had a crew in Florida. There was Joe, King Curtis, Killer Khan. Oh, who are the other heels? But we had a we had a great crew. We um we we we, we chartered planes every to, to get around Florida, West Palm Beach, and did a two two hour trips. And uh, on Sundays we had a double trip. Uh, Jacksonville in the afternoon. Orlando in the evening. So everybody's wife or girlfriend would cook a dish. And we'd everybody take on, we had our twin engine beaches that we take off and make the towns with because it, traveling was hard and we didn't, we didn't have to, we were top guys who we were making money and, you know, we could, and we had the, the planes wired, but we, we'd have a big uh, blowout, all kinds of food and stuff. Remember the Briscoes used to sneak up by the window, okay, and we'd pass them plates of food for lunch rather than go, them going out to eat. You know they knew where the they knew which side the the bread bread was buttered on. You know, <laughs> Japanese food, French. Uh, Joe was cooking uh, uh, Canadian roast. Uh, he'd, be bring, he'd bring a whole crock pot with him. <laughs> we had a good time. You know, in the old days. Uh, Doctor D, Dave Schultz. Didn't know him that well. Didn't know him that well. It was, uh, it was all right. He was good. Um, yeah, rugged guy, talked a lot, you know. Um, like I said, I wasn't close to him, didn't know him that well. Uh, there's that Stossel thing. I, I don't know if I, I don't know if I was there that night. It was a, it was a punk shot, but but uh, everybody loved it, you know. They wanted to see. Everybody was happy to see Stossel get, get slapped like that. <laughs> was uh, so, yeah. did, did your boy Fuji? Did, was he winding up the situation a little bit? Because in the in the in the shot where Stossel yeah. gets a smack, you can just see Fuji go. Just after yeah, his back, head off. I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure he had to. I'm sure he, he was. He's no. He's never a shrinking violet. Yeah, he can see. <laughs> he's a. Uh, he's really conspicuous by his presence in the back. <laughs> the back there. Uh, Ultimate warrior. Uh, he's actually said very nice. That or he had said very nice things about you. He was very complimentary about you. I I got along with him. He we just come into the territory. He was. Uh, he would travel with his wife. But they'd work out, and we're always working out. And he, uh, I, I was, I was going headed towards babyface. And anyway, I never worked with him. And uh, 
he he hung out with the the Bulldogs a lot. So and I I was I hung out with the Bulldogs. So you know got to know him through through them. And, and he was a good guy. He he was. Uh, I guess there's you know, a lot of things you crit criticized about him. He might have gone a little nuts later with his warrior gimmick and stuff. But uh, in the early years, he, he he was you know pretty fun and pretty down to earth. Maniac in the road. <laughs> in what sense? Oh, I mean, one time we, we were in Tallahassee, coming from the airport to the just the hotel, and he's slamming the slamming on the gas and slamming on the brakes, and you know, it's like a, it was like a car chase, like, like, like the you know nobody chasing us, you know, <laughs> like cops, and, and then, then we're going to, we're left for the building here. They left for the building. In the evening, I saw a walk. We were in a couple blocks away. And I could hear ur, ah, ur, screeching and tearing off. All well, you know, had four blocks to go. You know, it wasn't like it was a journey. <laughs> what was he trying to achieve? I don't know. A flat tire. <laughs> Where the brakes out? Who knows? Well, they say uh, there's no car faster than a rental car when it's not your tires. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was it. Yeah. Uh, two more. Uh, Rene Goulet. A good guy. He was in uh, Minneapolis uh, working when I first the first started being snooker. We had a big long trip up to Winnipeg in the car one night. He was singing uh, French French songs and we were drinking uh, red Red Mountain or uh, Strawberry Hill wine or something, and uh, drove all the way. From North Dakota to uh, to Winnipeg with him, and uh, had, had a good. He was a good guy. Then then later he took over as uh, became an agent. He was um, well liked, obviously, by the McMahons. They brought him back a couple times. He I think he had a couple tag belts, and uh, you know was around. And then eventually became an agent. Then and he just passed away a couple years ago. Yeah, apparently. Uh, yeah, apparently no one even knew for like a year. It was yeah, kept so he, secret. Nobody heard about him for. 10, 20 years, and all of a sudden, he, it was learned that he passed. And um, it's got to be, it's got to be the final one, the Iron Sheik. Ah, baby, he wasn't that. He was in that crew with the uh, Patera, and Flair, and uh, Bruggers, Brunzel, and Ganya. He was part of the. He was part of that crew. What an athlete he was. Uh, that. Um, Brett Azar, the guy that's playing him on the Young Rock, the movie. You probably don't know. There's a, a TV series out now uh, in America. I, I've, uh, I've I've actually written a book about the Rock oh. recently, so I, I know a bit, I know quite a lot about the Rock at the moment. Yeah, that's just come out, hasn't it? Yeah, he looks and he he picked up a lot of mannerisms and stuff. But he uh, broke into the business. He was a wrestling coach, uh, Olympic wrestler from Iran. Um, Bodyguard to the Shaw, and uh, when the Ayatollah came in, he had to get the hell out of there. But uh, he was uh, bodyguard to the Shaw. Uh, great. I, I think even the guys that they you'd bring to the barn to stretch him couldn't stretch him. The, the, the yeah, Hodges and the, uh, Joe Scarpellos, even Robinson, he said couldn't. Billy Robinson. But uh, he was. Yeah, I had good fun. I had fun with Cosgrove. And um, stupid he wasn't. He would. He could act stupid. I don't know. I don't, you know English. I, he could probably speak English better than you and I put together. You know. But uh, <laughs> I, 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 I don't. Baba, I, I don't understand. What the you know? And he would get you know. He was just. Uh, what well, he was an iron man. Yeah, he was just uh, always drinking a beer. Always. We're in Toronto. I was doing some stuff for Ghana and after I left WWF and we were way up in Ontario in the snow and we went across the street from a hotel to get breakfast and you know, eight, nine and 10 o'clock in the morning. So uh, the, he ordered, naturally orders a beer for breakfast in the, you know, well, in Canada, they, they got to keep the beer someplace warm because it'll freeze. If you put it outside the snow and stuff, it'll all burn it. So, I guess they just put the beer in the cooler and the waitress brings him a beer and it wasn't cold enough. Waitress, come, come here. 
Yeah, I think we are warm like piss. Outside, <laughs> snow up to Sheik's ass. Bring me cold beer. Yeah. There's always something, always something in January. <laughs> I spoke to Lanny Poffo maybe like two months ago, and he said there was always a weird thing that Sheik would always say with ladies, uh, you want to make arch with Sheik? Oh, yeah, make arch, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he was quite the uh, Persian lover. <laughs> was he actually the Persian lover, or did you just get tur turned down a lot? I, uh, I don't know if he was looking for gimmick or women. I, it's hard to say. <laughs> he was always, you know, always had his little green bag and, uh, well, I don't know, who knows what the hell he's up to? <laughs> Didn't he have a bag, man? No, no, he was. Uh, I guess he tried to drop it on a few guys a few times. <laughs> yeah. Going through customs or going through other people, you put his stuff in somebody else's suitcase a few times. But that's the word, anyway. <laughs> oh God! Do you know what? You've you've talked to me for two hours. I can't thank you enough, Don. Seriously, I mean, what a great oh, my interview! Pleasure. What a great interview! Your memory is unbelievable. The stories are fantastic. You should really have a podcast. <laughs> I do. Every Thursday. <laughs> Segway. Come on. Time. Making Waves. WWAB Network. Making Waves. Don Morocco, Avi Klein. There you go. So where does, uh, where does one find it? Uh, is it on iTunes? WWAB. Uh, uh, that's... Uh, it's... Uh, it's Chip Slipstream, StreamYard. StreamYard, WDBAB is the frequency. We're going to uh, Parthenon and uh, it's, uh, it's on another one, I'm not sure. But we got a whole, uh, he's got a whole crew Monday through Sunday running. He, uh, Avi Klein is the uh, organizer of this. And he, we have uh, <clears throat> myself on Thursday. Friday is uh, Duke the Dumpster, Mike Drosy, uh, Ray Lloyd's in it, uh, Glacier. Glacier, yeah. Yeah, Del, Del Wilkes, uh, the Patriot. Uh, Ken Patera now started last week, his first one. Paul Roma has got, uh, has got, a, got a program as well. So it's uh, Paul, Ken, Del, Ray. I'm missing somebody. Myself. Oh, uh, Bill Demont. Bill Demont as well. He was. Uh, he does a lot of work. His. Uh, he lost a daughter to uh, a drunken driver several years ago, and he does a lot of work. Does a lot of work on his podcast with the uh, uh, Mad Mothers Against Drunk Driving and and, and, uh, and other aspects like that. Yeah, you know, Bill Demont. He's a. He's the other member of our cast, and JC Farina. He's a he's a fan that does a wrap up, and, and we have a lot of people that uh, contribute. Uh, Kim Laronitis, uh, the um, animal's wife, hmm. she's uh, she participates in some of the, the we have a green room segment. Mickey Doyle, you know, Mickey Deuce, uh green room segment on on Saturday would involve quite a bit of wrestling. Mickey Doyle. Uh, an ex wrestler out of Detroit. Uh, a lot of ex wrestlers show up, hmm. you know, hmm. and, and other things. But it's, it's not limited to professional wrestling. It's a, we encompass a lot of a lot of subjects as so, we go along. So, at the very least, I hope to achieve. I mean, and I know I will at least tens of thousands of viewers. So I will send everybody over to that show on every single video, on every single clip, on everything. So. I really hope you get more uh, of an audience out of it as well. And um, we we run okay. we we uh, we get uh, messages from people in in England that are that uh, are watching our pro our program at the time, so it's available there. I, I know I don't know how. I'm a I'm a I'm a moron <laughs> when it comes to the 21st century. Just I just missed I missed the call, but uh, you know most of the time I have my wife or my daughter and my or my young grandkids helping me. Well, you know what, for that, I mean, I, I'm just as bad, I promise you. I mean, we had, like, audio issues for 10 minutes and we were just sort of, like, jabbing at wires all the way through because yeah, neither of us knew what to do. Yeah. <laughs> Once again, I'm going to thank you so much for joining me um, and I'm going to thank you for joining me as well because I've switched cameras now from that one to that one after two hours now. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Don Morocco, for joining us and I will catch you again next week. My pleasure, Aloha. Always, 
Nice bringing up some old stories, old memories. <laughs> <laughs>